needed to act as a deterrent for this type of behaviour. Secondly, to ensure that the partnership between football authorities and the police is close enough to improve the identification and sanctioning of offenders at matches. Thirdly, to ask if we give enough support to stewards can we improve their capacity to deal with discrimination consistently throughout the leagues? The football, can football improve the information flow of incident reporting on the pitch and support players? How can we double down on efforts to ensure match officials, stewarding operations, coaching and academy staff are all fully able to engage in their responsibilities to maintain an open and inclusive sporting environment. And also, initiatives to help increase the numbers of people from BME background in football professions beyond playing. Transparency and opportunities in the recruitment processes are absolutely central to this. This Government will now work with these key groups to deliver clear, tangible actions in the areas I have just described. My intention is to announce that these in partnership with football before the end of the summer. If we are able to deliver these before, then even better. I want to see change ready for the next season. Mr Speaker, the ongoing cross-government sport strategy, Sporting Future, a strategy for an active nation, seeks to ensure access to sport uh, is equal for all. It is vital that the atmosphere and environment in which sport and physical activity takes place in our communities, be it at grassroots or at elite level, is safe, supportive and free of discrimination and intolerance. The experience of players, staff and fans, therefore at football games, both home and abroad, will prove the ultimate test of success in this area. But I am confident that the appetite is there to accept this challenge, and by working in partnership we will squash and quash this disturbing, ugly recent trend in racism across our beautiful game. I commend this statement to the yeah. House. And Tom Watson. Mr Speaker, though we are only halfway through proceedings, it is a pleasure to see you remaining jolly and calm. <laughs> uh, and I commend the Minister for bringing this particular statement to the House. I thank her for advance sight of it. And I'm sure I speak for both sides of the House when I say we appreciate her personal commitment to tackling discrimination yeah. in sport uh, in all its forms. And I agree that the vast majority of football fans see racism, <laughs> homophobia, sectarianism and bigotry as the ugly side of the beautiful game. Yet hardly a week goes by without an example of discrimination. We were all shocked by the blatant racism during the game against Montenegro last month. Hearing Danny Rose say after that match that he can't wait to see the back of football because of racism is deeply depressing, but sadly not surprising. Because when young players face abuse time and time again, who can blame them for wanting to walk away? The bravery shown by those players is commendable, but they shouldn't have to be brave. They're just trying to do their jobs. So I agree with the minister when she says that players should never be punished for walking off a pitch after receiving racist abuse. And I was disappointed to hear that the Withenshaw manager, James Kinsey, has been sanctioned for taking his team off the pitch after alleged racism from a linesman. Now, I have some suggestions for the Minister to help battle bigotry as soon as it rears its head. Firstly, stewards can work more closely with police to identify offenders, intervene early and gather good evidence to facilitate arrests and charges. The Ministry of Justice could encourage the CPS to give football hate speech a higher priority and employ higher, harsher sentences. I think the government could increase support for education programmes like those run by Show Racism the Red Card and Kick It Out, uh, both of whom have had to see cuts as a result of central government cuts to local government. Yeah. And let us also be aware that the far right are attempting to infiltrate football again yeah. through groups like the Football Lads Alliance who marched on London only a few weeks ago, and some of their members were seen giving Nazi salutes. But I think we should also be aware that the problem is not just on the pitch and in the stands. 
It's online and in the media. The Minister mentions Crystal Palace's uh, Wilfried Zahar, who retweeted some of the horrendous racism he receives. Given so much racist abuse directed at players is online, will the Minister explicitly include hate crimes aimed at sporting figures in the online harms consultation? Raheem Sterling, in my view a hero, has called out the ways in which media portrayals fuel racism. In particular, the disparaging way a young black player is treated for buying a house for his mum compared to a white player doing the same. Does the Minister agree that there is a problem and that some news outlets need to be more responsible? It's not just racism, though, Mr Speaker. Other types of bigotry like homophobia and sectarianism plague the game. <coughs> The Scottish Parliament has united in committing £14 million since 2012 to tackle sectarianism on the terraces. Can she match that for English football? Campaigns like football versus homophobia are doing great work, but six out of ten LGBT supporters say they have witnessed homophobic, homophobic abuse. So the Minister is absolutely right that the vast majority of fans abhor discrimination of any kind. A small number of thugs who propagate this vile bigotry ruin football for the players and millions of fans who love the game. We don't always agree on things across these benches, but we're in absolute unity on this. Discrimination of any kind has no place in football. I and my team will do everything we can to work with her and her team to drive it out. Yeah, yeah. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his tone and collegiate approach on this. It's absolutely right that we stand together in this House on this matter when it comes to intolerance, whether it comes to sport, our communities up and down the land. It's absolutely right that we work to, together on this. Football cannot and should not be used as a cloak for racism and intolerance at any point. And it's a sign, as we know, that players are deciding to walk off the pitch because they've simply had enough. And I applaud them. And they they reserve the right to stay on and carry on with their job and enjoy the game, or they reserve the right to walk off and do what they feel is right. So I think that we should absolutely be willing to tackle the ugly side, as he describes, of the beautiful game. And I think members across this House will listen to the reaction from Danny Rose. It was heartbreaking. The bravery to do jobs and to speak out at this day and age, we need to support that, but they shouldn't feel they have to do that. It's right, as I say, that players should take action, and we are working with police to make sure that it's, uh, we're uh, able to support them. Uh, and indeed, the UK Football Policing Unit, alongside the Home Office, is going to absolutely continue to work around the action where there are concerns about hate crime and football and the rise of the far right all being used together to spread intolerance and to spread more fear and, uh, uh, and uh, issues across our community. So I think it's absolutely right that we look and use the online harms. White Paper and the Secretary of State have just said uh, harassment is included on this, and it's absolutely right that our sports stars and those people in uh, the front line are able to be supported through this process. So it's right. Let's stop it. Let's stand up to it. Everybody is on the right side of this and call it out and let's support uh, show racism risen to uh, the red card and also uh, kick it out. Use the app, make sure that we report to our clubs and we turn around in the stands. We know who these people are and make sure that don't do it on, in our name, don't do it in the name of our club and don't do it in the name of football. Bob Blackman. Thank you, I was appalled to hear Danny Rose say that he, as a professional footballer, couldn't wait for his career to end. He's a Tottenham legend yeah. for scoring the winning goal in the North London derby on his <laughs> debut with a stunning volley. Yeah. And he should be praised, yeah, yeah, praised yeah, yeah. as a footballer, not condemned yeah, yeah. by racist abuse. We must get to a position whereby those that utter racist abuse at football matches are identified, ejected, charged for their crime, and the good fans who don't want to see this happen are not punished as a result of the bad fans who utter this racist abuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. 
thank my honourable friend for absolutely standing up for the good fans in this. There are many good fans and this tars everyone with a very bad brush. We need to absolutely support the people that are doing the right thing on this. Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much Mr Speaker. Can I bring consensus back um, to the, the statement and uh, thank the Minister for ill sight of the statement and can associate myself with the comments made by the Minister and by the uh, Labour front bench and it's not often I can say that uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, the recent high profile incidences of racism in, in the game flies in the face of the fantastic work that has been carried out over the years by groups such as Show Racism, Red Card and Kick It Out. But sadly, despite the fact that football, well, in England at any rate, is a swimming in money, a relatively small amount is spent by the game on such initiatives. I very much welcome the tone and the action set out uh, by the Minister, and I think we can all agree that it's time for the footballing authorities and top level clubs to take this more seriously and invest resources appropriately. But not just invest, make proper policy and discipline decisions. The example the Minister and, and uh, the Shadow Minister has outlined of James Kinsey being disciplined for taking his team off the pitch following racist abuse is shameful. Yeah. Uh, can I praise the action also of players such as Graham Sterling and Danny Rose? Uh, to their abuse, but they must be supported better by bodies like UEFA, who issue all too often issue paltry fines that amount to pittance in the modern game. And Mr Speaker, as the, the Shadow Secretary of State um, has outlined, since 2012 the Scottish Government has invested £14 million to invest uh, to support the delivery of anti um, sectarian education in schools, prisons, workplaces and communities. Does she agree with me that knowledge education is one of the, most, the best means of tackling ignorance and must be part of the solution? And does she also agree with me that it's important that we have more public awareness of uh, the options open to fans in reporting racist incidents? The fact that less than half of fans are aware um, of the Kick It Out smartphone app is disappointing, to say the least. And finally, Mr Speaker, the lower leagues and the grassroots take their example from the top-level game. It's simply not good enough that in this day and age, only 4% still um, of coaching and management roles across the top four leagues in England are held by BME individuals. Would she also agree that, receive, that um, reducing discrimination from the boardrooms and the training ground would go a long way towards changing wider um, attitudes in society? Here, here. Here. I thank the honourable gentleman for raising important points here. The ability to report it, the confidence to report it through the Kick It Out app, also the education piece, this is absolutely vital. We want our football clubs across the land to be welcoming and diverse and representative of the communities they serve. They should be tolerant and absolutely a place that people want to be, not a place where people feel they have to speak out about behaviours that's not acceptable in the pub and across the wider community. So we can work together absolutely as uh, fellow sports fans to, to make sure that we do absolutely our level best to make sure that football is welcoming at every level. Hey, Greg Hans. I uh, commend the approach taken by the two premiership clubs in my constituency. Fulham has had a long tradition, pioneers in uh, combating uh, racism in football. Obviously, Chelsea have had uh, more trouble over the years, but the recent incident she referred to in December with uh, Raheem Sterling did lead to tough action against four supporters uh, led personally by the chairman of the club, Bruce Buck. Uh, but does she agree with me that clubs like Chelsea need to keep up the pressure uh, on these abhorrent fans uh, and make sure that, uh, that uh, we make sure that the racism of football is stamped out entirely uh, in the coming days. Here, here. I, I thank my honourable friend for, for raising the good work in the community. I have met with Fulham and been to their training ground, seen the work that they are doing in the community and also met with Chelsea about particular issues. I think the, the badge and the pride around the football club can be used so positively and we must harness that. Live effort. Mr Speaker, I had the uh, pleasure this year of uh, judging the com Football Community Trust uh, Club of the Year awards and uh, I was able to read the testimonies of many football clubs and see just how much work that is going on at those football clubs to tackle the issue of racism in our communities. And football as an institution probably does more than any single institution, but does she agree with me that if we are going to show leadership as politicians, that we have to put our own houses in order so, and set the highest standards for membership of our organisations when it comes to issues of Islamophobia and anti-Semitic behaviour. 
I thank the Honourable Gentleman for raising that particular event that here at House of Commons Terrace showed so much good work across clubs, across the land. But it's absolutely right that we do not lose sight of the positives going on in our communities, but above all that we continue to be afraid about standing up where there is intolerance, because frankly that does no one any good. Uh, Julia Lopez. I recently attended my first West Ham game at the London Stadium. It has an amazing family atmosphere and I spoke to their foundation about how, what they're doing to support the Kick It Out campaign. Would my honourable friend agree that the football matches have an especial capacity to bring people together of all ages and backgrounds and racist language and abuse must never be allowed to undermine that by normalising division in the eyes of young people or making aspiring players feel excluded from sharing the joy of the game? I thank the Honourable Lady for, for raising this. I think football has come an incredible long way in terms of where we have been since the 80s, but frankly that is not good enough. It is a family game, it is incredibly welcoming, but it is the small pockets of people who continue to use the cloak of football as no disguise, frankly, for intolerance, and they should know better. They should look around them and show it is them that have got this wrong. Ion Wurra. I and the vast majority of Newcastle United fans condemn utterly the racist abuse that Zaha received after the Crystal Palace game on Saturday. I was at the game, Mr Speaker, and there certainly was no abuse in the Gallagher end where I was. That would not have been the case 30 or 40 years ago when I would avoid St James's Park because of the racists there. But the club, football institutions, fans came together to kick the racists out. That hasn't happened in certain European countries, which are frankly still in the dark ages. So could the minister look at taking UEFA to the European Court of Human Rights? Footballers are working when they are playing the beautiful game. They have a right to work in an atmosphere where abuse is absolutely not tolerated. I thank the Honourable Lady, who always highlights the beauty of her football club. Uh, I intend to meet with UEFA and indeed FIFA in due course. These international bodies have the chance to work with us to use their global standing to make change. No one's going to wait any longer. Right word. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, West Bromwich Albion pioneered the fight against racism in football in the 1970s with club legends like Cyril Regis, Brendan Batts and Laurie Cunningham. Will the Minister support police, both in the West Midlands and around the country, in bringing charges against those who subject players, fans and officials with racist abuse from the stands? I think it's absolutely right, cross government, that we stand fully beside the police if they have the evidence that we are there to back them up. I've met with West Midlands Police about forthcoming uh, Commonwealth Games and their commitment to make sure that the community is well policed and looked after, and this is surely part of it. Mike Kane. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. As you know, I'm a lifelong Man City fan and the season ticket holder, so I'm extraordinarily proud of Raheem Sterling both on the pitch and his action on anti racism off it. I'm also, uh, my wife and I are also fans of Withenshaw Town. In January, uh, Kinsey, the manager, James, took the players off the pitch when the assistant referee was clearly racist to one of our uh, players. Now, that charge against the assistant referee has been subsequently proven and he's had a, a charge of disrepute against him. Yet the town, uh, town and the manager still face charges for leading the players off that pitch today. Does the Minister agree with me? The FA needs to show more consistency and leadership about whether players and when players should walk off the pitch and whether fines should be introduced uh, for when it does happen. I absolutely agree with the Honourable Gentleman. I think the FA needs to review its uh, rules and guidance to give uh, clubs the ability to be effective and consistent in these situations. Ultimately, as we've heard, this is a workplace. This is where people should not be subjected to abuse. They should be supported on either being able to walk away from it or decide to stand up for it. Maria Caulfield. 
Speaker, can I welcome the Minister's strong statement on the racism in football? I'm sure she'll join me in wishing Arsenal Football Club the best of luck in their Europa League game this evening. But would she also uh, join me in welcoming the hard work of Sussex County FA, who take a strong zero-tolerance approach at grassroots level, uh, making it very easy to report any incidents of racism, uh, carrying out swift investigations and taking out strong sanctions? Does she agree that stamping out racism at grassroots level is a key to tackling racism in football? Salute the Honourable Lady's anti-racism, and I have to say I salute her footballing preference. I was not aware of her allegiance, but she is to be commended for her good taste. Minister. A very important fixture against Napoli tonight, so I understand, Mr Speaker. And so I may, uh, may I wish everybody involved a safe and pleasant experience. But turning to the county FA, this is where leadership on a local level can really make a change. And I salute Sussex FA for doing the right thing. <laughs> Imran Hussein. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I firstly pay tribute to the courage of Raheem Sterling and others for speaking out and making it clear that racism in football will never ever defeat us. Uh, can I also pray, uh, thank the Minister and the Shadow Secretary of State for their statements in condemning overt racism in mainstream, in, in national football, but also following on from the Honourable Lady, there, co there continues to be covert institutionalised obstacle placed in it for local teams in local football. What is she doing to tackle covert racism in grassroots football? Minister. I think grassroots football has a huge uh, power in this. If you see it on the local marshes, you're going to think that it's acceptable if you're in one of the main stadiums. And frankly, it's not acceptable on either level. So let's absolutely make sure that grassroots level, people know it is uncalled for, it's not needed. Report it to the club, stand up, uh, stand up to it, call it out, and that will make the change. Mr Oliver Heald. Does the Minister agree with me that support for Gareth Southgate's team is something that united people uh, yeah, in the nation yeah, yeah, and yeah. that it was because they seemed a representation of what we're like in this country now and they had a talent that was tremendous, all those young new players coming through. And does she agree with me that if they go overseas to somewhere uh, as guests, it's just not acceptable for our players particularly wonderful players like uh, Raheem Sterling, to be uh, attacked in this way. And isn't it almost uh, a Foreign Office matter that we should be making strong representations through, through the Foreign Office and, and our diplomatic service to get this stopped? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think our football experience, both home and abroad, is absolutely vital. It's where we can use our standing. We have the Lionesses playing uh, the World Cup uh, this summer in France, alongside the Scottish women's team as well. We have the Euro semi-finals coming up and the women's Euros in 2021 and games here in England. So there's a chance to use the fact that all eyes are on football uh, on these shores to show that actually, home and away, we do the right thing. Anna Bardell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Sectarianism, racism, and homophobia have no place in the game of football. And some of these clubs, and indeed the FA, could look for good examples in the women's game, and indeed in my own football club, Livingston FC, where I used to sell the odd pie when I was a student. Um, can I thank the Minister for her statement and her bold action on this? The FA chairman has recognised the women's game as a beacon of inclusivity and she mentions that we do the right thing abroad. Let's not forget that the World Cup is going to happen shortly in Qatar, a country that should never have got the World Cup in the first place and where it is illegal to be homosexual. We need to take stronger action against those countries and consider withholding teams perhaps going to those countries to send the strongest possible message. I think the Honourable Lady makes some very pertinent points, as ever, and this is something that I know she's passionate about in all areas. I have met with representatives of Qatar to say that absolutely our expectations in terms of sending fans abroad to be safe and to enjoy football and to be who they want to be should be supported and must be. Marcus Jones. Racism in football or any other sense 
is unacceptable. I welcome the discussions that my honourable friend has talked about with the football authorities in regard to professional football. Can she also say what discussions she has had with those authorities with regard to children's and amateur football, which is equally important to make sure that we are teaching our children that this type of racist abuse is completely unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. I thank my honourable friend for, for raising up and down the game getting this right. It's really important. And one of the reasons that I called the summit against racism is I felt that there was not a coordinated approach up and down the game. And if we don't get this right on a grassroots level, how can we say we're getting it right on a national level? I'm continuing to work with football to hold them to account, but I think they know they've got a problem and they need to be at the table at every level. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, the, and thank the Minister for her statement. The Minister will know that, and, and yourself, Mr. Speaker, will also know that Northern Ireland supporters were voted the best supporters at the Euros in 2016 by all the supporters of the other countries who were there. That has happened for a number of reasons because the IFA and the Northern Ireland Supporters Clubs have worked together to defeat terrorism and stop terrorism on the, on the terraces at Windsor Park and elsewhere. Ten year plan. Can I ask the Minister, has she had an opportunity to speak to the, the Irish Football Association and to the Northern Ireland Football Association uh, to gauge some of the things that we have done to take sectarianism out of the, out of the terraces and make football a pleasurable experience for both, both Protestants and Roman Catholics across all of Northern Ireland? I, w I have spoken uh, through interministerial groups, including officials from Northern Ireland, on uh, issues in relation to sport. I will be visiting Port Rush very soon, which I'm very much looking forward to, particularly in the week of the Masters. But I think it's absolutely right to get into the community clubs, where it's working so well in Northern Ireland, to listen and learn and share that best practice. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will my honourable friend uh, join me in congratulating Crawley Town uh, FC for last Saturday uh, taking part in the Kick It Out initiative? It is absolutely right uh, what she is doing and what they are doing in terms of tackling uh, racism. And perhaps uh, she might uh, pay a visit once again to Crawley, where she will be most welcome. I thank my honourable friend for raising Kick It Out, which does, uh, heading down from the Premier League into our other clubs, do a really positive intervention experience. And of course, Crawley hosts the uh, Brighton and Hove uh, women's team as well, and has great leadership across all levels with women in football as well. I have it on my radar. I'll be delighted to be there as soon as possible. Drew Stevens. Children are not born racist, they learn racism, which is why anti-racism education is so vital. So will the Minister speak to the Secretary of State for Education about long-term government support for a programme of anti-racism education involving, for example, a pioneering educational charity show racism the red card? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to pay tribute to show racism to the red card and all of those doing great work within our community clubs and up and down the land. I think it's absolutely right that we are listening to our youngsters on this. In terms of education, there's been round tables and governing bodies at the table in terms of the school sport action plan. But we need to see more people across the game, mentors and leaders of all different backgrounds, because that helps to show uh, women and girls and people all across the game there's a chance for them in football at every level. Ms Redmond Davey. Welcoming her statement today and her leadership on this issue, will the Minister say a little bit more about why she thinks there has been this appalling upsurge in racism in football? And does she agree with me that Raheem Sterling was right to call out parts of the British media in the way they treat black British footballers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank the honourable gentleman for, for his kind words on this. This is somewhere where actually if we all work together we can make a huge difference. I think social media has not been helpful in this. This has been a platform for people to ply racism and hate and, uh, and to have some kind of disguise of who they are. And I hate to say it, if that's then crept into the stadiums then perhaps that's part of it. I think it allows us to look when we've got the online harms white paper about the new duty of care 
when it comes to social media. There are too many cowards out there who think that football is a cloak to cover their intolerance. No more of that. Nigel Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for her robust statement. Remarkably, she's managed to unite the House. Um, there's a lot of money in football, four and a half billion pounds in the Premier League alone. Is enough of this money flowing to stamp out abuse and promote equality? And are fines harsh enough to also stamp out abuse? I thank my honourable friend for, for raising the, the money issue here. Ultimately, we can put more into this and we can show leadership as well. I think the two should go together. I think everything should be on the table here. Heavy fines for people who don't react. And above all, we should be just showing leadership, top and bottom, at every level. And money, frankly, should be no object. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Minister join me in paying tribute to community football clubs such as the Bristol Panthers, the LGBT club in Bristol, and the East Don Cowboys, both in my constituency, who do so much to combat hatred, whether it's racism or homophobia? And perhaps you'd like to come and visit them. I would love to. I love Bristol. The Rainbow Laces campaign is vital as well. There is room in football for everybody. There is a team for everybody out there, and I'm delighted there's so much warm welcome in Bristol. Stephen Doughty. Speaker, um, as one of the ambassadors of the Cardiff City Foundation, can I commend um, the work of the Cardiff City Foundation and also the club itself in working with Kick Out and other organisations to tackle racism and discrimination? But would she join me in welcoming in LGBT inclusive teams like Cardiff Titans, uh, Cardiff Dragons, and London Titans, who do amazing work bringing people into the game? I saw at my own local Mellor the amount of sporting clubs who are there for people to join into. What I would say is have a look because it certainly sounds like there's a great opportunity in Cardiff to get involved at sport every level and that's what this government wants to see. A sentence each will suffice, I think. Chris Stevens, one sentence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister make sure that there is a cross-departmental initiative to fund Great organisations like Show Racism and EdCab who are doing fantastic work in the constituency of Glasgow South West. I will lobby very hard. I believe the Chancellor is here and heard that too. Paul Sweeney. Will the Minister undertake to speak to uh, fans organisations like Fans Against Criminalisation to make sure that the root of sorting out bigotry and racism lies in sorting out our fans and using them to boot it out rather than criminalising them unnecessarily? We've got to find a balance here of, of supporting fans that do the right thing and making sure that we make an example of people who choose to do the wrong thing. If he has any ideas on that, I'm happy to hear more. Garthy. Mr Speaker, as the legendary John Barnes has said, if every racist who came to football was silenced, football stadiums would still be full of racists. So it's not just enough to stamp out expressions of racism. What can we do to tackle the underlying causes? Yeah. I think we need to see more leadership in the game, more people rising to the top, uh, such as Darren Moore, who came and gave me his thoughts, and I thank him for that, Chris Hewton, Sol Campbell, and uh, Keith Cole. But there's not enough people that we can see getting to the top and being able to speak out. We need to support them to do that and have a mix of people there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We applaud the likes of Raheem Sterling. Danny Rose and the, the legend that is John Barnes. But does the Minister not agree with me that in order to tackle racism within football, we need to tackle racism in the wider society? I think the two go together. We can tackle the ills in the wider society by rooting out the trouble that people uh, manage to, uh, sorry, rooting out the uh, cloak that they use of football to explain bad behaviour in wider society. Don't use football, don't use sport as a way to have intolerance. We don't want it. Get rid of it. My bet. Does the Minister agree that racism doesn't merely exist in football grounds, it also exists in the boardroom? 30% of players are BME, but less than 5% of managers. What is she going to do to require the football authorities to address this issue? I think the Honourable Gentleman makes an important point. At the racism summit that I held, there were people outside football holding football to account about not being diverse and welcome enough. They know the problem. It's absolutely time to change who's at the top because that changes everything. Abraham. Racism and discrimination in football. 
and other sports reflect society as a, as a whole. So would the Minister agree with me, we need to be not only demanding more of our football and sporting institutions, but also of our leaders in the public and private sector, and dare I say it, in politics. Yeah. We all have a hugely important role to play in this, and I absolutely agree with the Honourable Lady. We want sport and politics and our whole country to be open, tolerant, diverse, equal. We all have a role to make that happen. Justin Madders. Okay, Mr. Speaker, can I draw the Minister's attention to a game between UK Parliament FC and show racism the red card that's going to take place next month? And whilst I can't uh, promise to score four goals like I did on the last game for UK Parliament FC, um, I hope it will be an opportunity for everyone to see that the whole House is united in uh, fighting all forms of discrimination. Four goals? Wow, you've now set yourself up for that. Who wants to be the goalkeeper? <laughs> Well done, Doggerty Hughes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a, a gay Roman Catholic of Irish heritage, growing up in the west of Scotland, I'm very much aware of some of the issues that the minister raises, and I'm aware of my own local clubs, Clybank, Yoker Athletic, Dumbarton, and Avail, who have challenged uh, the community to think differently over the last 20 years. But can the minister tell me where, in terms of disability discrimination, there needs to be more aid to football clubs to challenge them on giving disabled fans and disabled footballers more access to the game? Yeah. 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 I think the Honourable Gentleman makes an important point. The experience of our disabled fans across the country is not equal, it's not fair, it's not good enough. The whole of the House is listening and uh, the UK is watching football give everyone a fair experience, particularly our disabled fans. Ombre. Speaker, as a uh, Palace season ticket holder, I spend many a happy uh, Saturday afternoon chanting he's just good, too good for you about Wilf Saha as he runs rings round uh, Opposition defenders. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that uh, Wilf Zaha needs to be recognised not just for the wizardry he displays on the pitch, but also for the work that he does for football for peace yeah. in uniting communities? Yeah. I, I think players such as that, still feeling they have to stand up like this, shows the problem. But the fact that they do, we have to support them absolutely, as you have done on the terraces, and we should do as they speak out. Thank you. Order. Statement. The Prime Minister. With permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to make a statement on yesterday's European Council. But before I do, I am sure that the whole House will welcome the news this morning that the Metropolitan Police have arrested Julian Assange, yeah. arrested for breach of bail after nearly seven years in the Ecuadorian Embassy. He has also been arrested in relation to an extradition request from the United States authorities. This is now a legal matter before the courts. My right hon. Friend, the Home Secretary, will make a statement on this later, but I would like to thank the Metropolitan Police for carrying out their duties with great professionalism and to welcome the cooperation of the Ecuadorian Government in bringing this matter to a resolution. Mr Speaker, this goes to show that in the United Kingdom no one is above the law. Turning to the Council, my priority is to deliver Brexit and to do so in an orderly way that does not disrupt people's lives. So I continue to believe we need to leave the European Union with a deal as soon as possible. And of course this House has voted repeatedly to avoid a no deal. Yet despite the efforts of members on all sides, we have not so far been able to vote for a deal. So ahead of the Council, I wrote to President Tusk to seek a short extension to the Article 50 period to the 30th of June. Critically, I also requested that any extension should be terminable so that whenever this House agrees a deal and ratifies the withdrawal agreement, we can get on and leave. And I did this not merely to avoid a further delay beyond ratification of the withdrawal agreement, but specifically to retain our ability to leave the EU without having to hold European parliamentary elections on the 23rd of May. Mr Speaker, the discussions at the Council were difficult and, unsurprisingly, many of our European partners share the deep frustration that I know so many of us feel in this House over the current impasse. There was a range of views about the length of an extension, with a large number of Member States preferring a longer extension to the end of this year or even into the next. In the end, what was agreed by the UK and the EU27 was a compromise, an extension lasting until the end of October. 
The Council also agreed that we would update on our progress at the next meeting in June. Critically, as I requested, the Council agreed that this extension can be terminated when the withdrawal agreement has been ratified. So, for example, if we were to pass a deal by the 22nd of May, we would not have to take part in European elections, and when the EU has also ratified, we will be able to leave at 11pm on the 31st of May. In short, the date of our departure from the EU and our participation in the European parliamentary elections remains a decision for this House. As President Tusk said last night, during this time, the course of action will be entirely in the UK's hands. In agreeing this extension, there was some discussion in the Council about whether stringent conditions should be imposed on the UK for its EU membership during this period, but I argued against this. I put the case that there is only a single tier of EU membership with no conditionality attached beyond existing treaty obligations. The Council conclusions are clear that during the course of the extension, the UK will continue to hold full membership rights. In turn, I assured my fellow leaders that the UK will continue to be bound by all our ongoing obligations as a member state, including the duty of sincere cooperation. The United Kingdom plays a responsible and constructive role on the world stage, and we always will. That is the kind of country we are. The choices we face the choices we face are stark, and the timetable is clear. I believe we must now press on at pace with our efforts to reach a consensus on a deal that is in the national interest. I welcome the discussions that have taken place with the opposition in recent days and the further talks which are resuming today. <laughs> this is not the normal way of British politics, and it is uncomfortable for many in both the government and opposition parties. Reaching an agreement will not be easy, because to be successful, it will require both sides to make compromises. But however, challenging, but however challenging it may be politically, I profoundly believe that in this unique situation, where the House is deadlocked, it is incumbent on both front benches to seek to work together to deliver what the British people voted for. And I think that the British people expect their politicians to do just that when the national interest demands it. I hope that we can reach an agreement on a single unified approach that we can put to the House for approval. But if we cannot do so soon, then we will seek to agree a small number of options for the future relationship that we will put to the House in a series of votes to determine which course to pursue. And as I have made clear before, the Government stands ready to abide by the decision of the House, but to make this process work, the Opposition would need to agree to this too. With the House's consent, we could also bring forward the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, which is a necessary element of any deal, whichever course we take. This bill will take time to pass through both Houses, so if we want to get on with leaving, we need to start this process soon. And it could also provide a useful forum to resolve some of the outstanding issues in the future relationship. Crucially, Mr Speaker, any agreement on the future relationship may involve a number of additions and clarifications to the political declaration. So I am pleased that at this Council all 27 Member States responded to my update on the ongoing cross-party talks by agreeing that the European Council is prepared to reconsider the political declaration on the future relationship in accordance with the positions and principles stated in its guidelines and statements. The Council also reiterated that the withdrawal agreement itself could not be reopened. Mr Speaker, I know the whole country is intensely frustrated that this process to leave the European Union has not still been completed. I never wanted to seek this extension, and I deeply regret that we have not yet been able to secure agreement in this House for a deal that would allow us to leave in a smooth and orderly way. I know too that this whole debate is putting members on all sides of the House under immense pressure and causing uncertainty across the country, and we need to resolve this. So let's use the opportunity of the recess to reflect on the decisions that will have to be made swiftly on our return after Easter, and let us then resolve to find a way through this impasse, so that we can leave the European Union with a deal as soon as possible, so that we can avoid having to hold those European parliamentary elections, and above all, so that we can fulfil the democratic decision of the referendum, deliver Brexit and move our country forward. This is our national duty as elected members of this House, and nothing today is more pressing or more vital. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank the Prime Minister for an advanced copy of her statement. Mr. Speaker, yesterday EU leaders agreed to grant the United Kingdom an Article 50 extension to the 31st of October. This means that Britain will now have to start the process of holding European elections in the extraordinary situation of not knowing whether the new MPs will take their MEPs rather will take their seats or for how long. This has come just three weeks after the Prime Minister told the House she was not prepared to delay Brexit any longer than the 30th of June. The second extension in the space of a fortnight represents not only a diplomatic failure, but it is another milestone in the government's mishandling of the entire Brexit process. A measure of this could be seen in this House on Monday, when one third of her party voted against her own policy to request a short delay and four of her Cabinet members abstained. And can the Prime Minister also confirm that the request by the Leader of the House on Tuesday for the EU to reopen the withdrawal agreement has also been rebuffed? The Prime Minister stuck rigidly to a flawed plan and now the clock has run down, leaving Britain in limbo and adding to the deep uncertainty of business, workers and people all across this country. Mr Speaker, I welcome that the Prime Minister finally decided to reach out to the opposition last week and open talks to try and find a breakthrough. The fact that the invitation didn't even come at the 11th hour, but at five past midnight, three days after the Prime Minister had missed her own Brexit deadline of the 29th of March, is a reflection of the Government's fundamental error in not proceeding by consensus. However, Mr Speaker, I can report to the House that the talks now taking place between the opposition and the Government are serious, detailed and ongoing, and I welcome the constructive engagement that we have had. Although this view may not be universally shared by many on the Conservative benches, I also welcome the indications from the Government they may be willing to move in the key areas that have prevented the Prime Minister's deal from being supported on this side of the House. If these talks are to be a success, resulting in an agreement to bring our country back together, the government will have to compromise. That is why it is with disappointment that I read the Secretary of State for International Trade's letter this week in what seemed to be an attempt to scupper meaningful talks by all but ruling out Labour's customs union proposals. A proposal, I might add, which is supported by business and industry bodies, bodies, as well as by all leading trade unions in this country. It is a proposal that European Union leaders and the Irish Taoiseach just yesterday have said is both credible and negotiable. Labour will continue to engage constructively in talks because we respect the results of the referendum and we are committed to defending jobs, industry and living standards by delivering a close economic relationship with the European Union and securing frictionless trade with improved rights and standards. If that is not possible, we believe all options should remain on the table, including the option of a public vote. Yeah. And Mr Speaker, we see no advantage, no advantage in the proposals of the Secretary of State for International Trade to create distance and divergence in our trading relationship with our largest trading partner. This House must also bear in mind that after a deal has passed, the current Prime Minister said she will step down. We have no idea who may succeed her. So with that in mind, with that in mind, we have to entrench any agreement because some of those already throwing their hats into the ring have said they would scrap the Human Rights Act, they would rip up burdensome regulation or would even prefer to leave without any deal at all. Some on the Conservative benches want nothing more than to use Brexit to create a race to the bottom, opening up our economy to US big pharma companies in our National Health Service, hormone-treated beef on our plates, slash workers' rights and consumer standards, and to have the UK become a virtual tax haven on the shores of Europe. 
Let me be clear to the Prime Minister and to the country. Labour will not support any deal that would leave us open to such a dystopian vision for the future of this country. It is incumbent on all of us now to find a way forward. We must continue to talk to each other. And if the government is serious, the red lines must move and we must see a real compromise. I look forward to the discussions in the coming days and even at this late stage to work to find a deal that can command not only the support of this House, but perhaps more importantly, the support of the public across this country too. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and can I say to the Leader of the Opposition that the talks between uh, the Government and the Opposition have indeed been serious. They are detailed and they are uh, being taken forward in a constructive and positive fashion. Um, we did, of course, offer uh, talks at an earlier stage uh, than uh, very recently, but I'm pleased that we are now able to sit down in this, uh, in this way. Uh, he raised the issue about the European parliamentary elections. Of course, had had members in this House voted with a majority to agree the withdrawal agreement on the 29th of March, we would have guaranteed leaving on the 22nd of May and not holding the European Parliamentary elections. Um, at, um, at the time, obviously, the right honourable gentleman did not feel able to support a deal to enable us not to uh, hold those European Parliamentary elections. It is still possible to do so, and we will continue to work on that. He, he asked, talked about the need for us to protect jobs, industry and living standards, and indeed that is what we have been aiming to do with the deal that we agreed with the European Union, um, but not just in relation to the deal with the European Union. Actually, it is this Government that is presided over record levels of people in employment. It is this job, it is this Government that has seen people's li helping people with their living standards with tax cuts for 32 million, uh, 32 million people. He talked about the future relationship and the need for us to the need to entrench aspects of the future relationship. Of course, the government did on the 29th of March say that we would accept the amendment that was put down on the order paper by the honourable member for Stoke-on-Trent Central, uh, which would uh, require Parliament to have that role in looking at the future relationship and the negotiating objectives for the future. And what that clearly makes the case is that any government any government, as it's going through those negotiations, will of course have to ensure that they are taking Parliament with them in agreeing that, uh, that future relationship. And on the, on the issue of uh, coming together in an agreement, the, the point is very simple. Um, I'm not prepared just to accept Labour's policies. The Labour Party isn't prepared just to accept our policies. As the, as the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Hoban and St Pancras has said, this takes compromise on both sides. And that's what we're doing, sitting down seriously to find a way that enables this House to ensure that there is a deal that commands a majority so we can leave the European Union, fulfil the vote of the British people in 2016 in the referendum, and do so in a way that does indeed protect jobs and living standards and industry. Yes. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, may I urge my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, to stick to her commitment to lead the country through to the conclusion of the Brexit process and to ignore some of the vicious attacks being made upon her by her yeah. uh, more extreme right-wing colleagues. Uh, can I also ask her, given that she rightly points out in the national interest that the next obvious step is to reach a settlement between the government and the principal opposition party on the best way forward, uh, can she indicate that it is clear that the minimum that requires is some sort of customs arrangement and sufficient regulatory alignment at least to keep our trade as open and free as it has been across the Channel and in the Republic of Ireland? And can she negotiate that so it does actually bind any successor government in future uh, negotiations? Uh, my right hon. Learned Friend is right that, of course, as we look to that future relationship, we are looking at the customs arrangement that would be in place in that future relationship. We have already indicated, as is reflected in fact in the political declaration, that we want to retain the benefits of a customs union of no tariffs, uh, no quotas, no rules of origin checks, and that is provided for in the, uh, in the political declaration. 
importantly stands. Of course, what we do see is, is we haven't been able to uh, enshrine that in legal text because it's not possible for the European Union to negotiate that treaty with us until we're a third country, until we're out of the European Union. Uh, so any commitments that are made here will be about the negotiating objectives that we take through into that, uh, into that process, but there will still be negotiations to be had with the European Union. Um, but in uh, terms of uh, adding to and clarifying what is in that political declaration and the position of the uh, UK government, obviously, as I've indicated, the EU Council have said that they would be willing to look at additions and clarifications to that political declaration. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of her statement. Mr. Speaker, what a total fiasco the past few weeks, months and years have been under this shambolic Tory government. The UK did not leave the EU in March, and thankfully, given the efforts of SNP politicians and others in this place, and the goodwill of the European Union, we will not crash out of the EU on Friday. What an irony that it's the European Union that's got the UK out of this mess. Let that be a lesson for members in this place. It is the EU that has put the interest of our citizens in the UK first, our businesses, our farmers and our fishermen. We should not be lambasting the EU, we should be thanking them. With the European Union agreeing to a further extension to Article 50, the Prime Minister must use this time to hold a second EU referendum with the option of remaining on the ballot paper. It is now a very real possibility that we can remain in the European Union. Mr Speaker, there were a total of 133 days between the 1997 general election and the the devolution referendum in Scotland. As of today, there are 204 days until the new Brexit deadline on the 31st of October. So will the Prime Minister now remove the ridiculous excuse that there isn't enough time to hold a second referendum with Remain on the ballot paper? Scotland did not vote for Brexit and should not be forced to accept any Brexit deal that will harm our interests. The only way forward is to put the decision back to the people. Scotland will not support a Brexit deal cooked up by the Brexit-supporting Labour and Tory parties. So, Mr Speaker, let me ask this. <coughs> Prime Minister, yesterday you ducked and dived my questioning, so a simple yes or no will suffice. Has your government offered a second EU referendum in talks with the Labour Party? Yeah. Yes or no? no. Yeah. Has the Labour Party requested a second EU referendum in the talks? No, yes, yes or no? Or no. Yeah. Is the Labour Party cozying up to the Tories asking to end freedom of movement as a price for their support for a Tory deal? Yes Yes or no? no. And finally, Mr Speaker, will the Prime Minister recognise that she cannot fix this mess alone, stop ignoring the people of Scotland, open up meaningful discussions with the devolved governments and with civic society? Start leading by listening, Prime Minister, and please get her head out of the sand. Uh, right honourable gentleman, uh, the government has not offered a second referendum. The, uh, and our position, I said to him yesterday in PMQs that our position on that issue had not changed. A second referendum has been rejected twice by this House. Uh, but of course, as legislation, as legi- when legislation goes through, once we've agreed a deal and legislation is going through for the bill that puts that in place, I'm sure there will be members of this House, because there are members who do support a second referendum, who will want to press their case during that, uh, during that legislation going through. I believe, I continue to believe, it's not an excuse, there isn't an issue of excuse about timing. I believe that it's important for us to deliver on the first referendum that took place in 2016 uh, on the result of that. Uh, of that. And can I just say to the right honourable gentleman, if he's so, if he's so interested in uh, referenda, the question is, will he now abide by the result of the 2014 Scottish oh. referendum? Yes or no? Sir William Cash. Thank you, thank you Mr Speaker. That does, my, does, my, does my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, appreciate the anger that her abject surrender last night has generated across the country, having broken a hundred times promises a hundred times not to extend the time. She knows what I'm saying and she's, she's done that. Does she also accept that this withdrawal agreement 
undermines our democracy, the constitutional status of Northern Ireland, our right to govern ourselves, control over our laws, and undermines our national interest. Will she resign? I think you know the answer to that. Can I, can I, can I say to my honourable friend, first of all, I do not, not recognise the description of the withdrawal agreement that he has put before this House. I believe we have negotiated a good deal for the United Kingdom. He, re he references the fact that I have, he's absolutely right, on many, many occasions in this House, and he and other members of, of my honourable friends have been keeping count. I had said that I wanted us to leave the European Union on the 29th of March, and indeed I did. I voted for the, the UK to leave the European Union on the 29th of March. I wanted us to set in train that guaranteed leaving on the 22nd of May. I voted to leave on the 22nd of May. Sadly, not sufficient number of members across this House voted to leave the European Union on those dates, and hence the extension has been requested to enable us to come to a position where this House can agree a majority, on a majority, on a deal that we can then deliver on leaving the European Union. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for putting the national interest yeah. above her party's interest in rejecting no deal, applying yeah. for and agreeing to an extension yeah. to Article yeah. 50? Yeah. We may now have more time, but our businesses face more uncertainty. Yeah. So may I encourage her during the Easter recess to take her own advice and to reflect on the decisions that need to be made yeah, yeah. and decide to put her deal to the British people yeah. so that they can decide whether they still wish to leave. Now we know the actual choices that Brexit involves or remain so we can finally bring this crisis facing our country to a conclusion. Yeah. As I to the right honourable gentleman, as I indicated to the leader of the SNP, uh, I, uh, the, neither I nor the government have changed our uh, view on the need for this House, for this Parliament, to deliver on the result of the first referendum. Uh, but can I also say to the right honourable gentleman, as I said in my statement, I think it is for all of us across this House to recognise the decisions that now face us. It is for this House to determine whether we are going to deliver Brexit for the British people. We have that opportunity. We can work together to find an agreement that will command a majority of this House. And if we do that in time, we can leave the European Union without holding the European parliamentary elections. Dame Caroline Spellman. Mr Speaker, um, in my region already there are car factories that are in a forced shutdown because of the Brexit uncertainty. So could I thank the Prime Minister for helping us avoid a no-deal crash-out and through her the 27 heads of state who supported that decision. Could she elaborate a bit more on her words about creating a forum to establish our future relationship with Europe? I, I thank my uh, right honourable friend for her question. I think she's referring to uh, references that I had made previously about the importance as we're looking at that negotiation on a future relationship for making sure not only that Parliament has a greater role in that process, but also that we take uh, wider uh, have wider consultations with civil society, with businesses, with trade unions. And it is the exact format of that forum has not yet been determined. But I think that will be an important element of the next stage of the uh, process to ensure that all voices are being heard and uh, can contribute to the debate on that future relationship. So Vincent Cable. The Prime Minister has again acknowledged that, notwithstanding her own personal objections, the House could choose to attach a referendum amendment to the withdrawal bill. Yep. Uh, bearing in mind the constitutional advice that we shared in cross-party talks a few weeks ago, would she now ask her officials to prepare a timetable completed before the end of October in which such a hypothetical poll could be conducted if the House wills it? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the uh, right honourable gentleman, he's aware of the government's position on the issue that he has raised. As I said, there are those in the House who may wish to press their case on this matter when the legislation uh, is going through. And it, and, uh, but as I would also gently remind him, the House has already rejected that proposal of a second referendum twice. Patrick McLaughlin. Will the Prime Minister take the opportunity 
again to remind the House that when the Leader of the Opposition said that he was only invited to talks at five past twelve, he actually refused talks some time ago. And that would have meant that we could have moved this process on a lot quicker. Is it not the case that whatever, that whatever we say, the simple fact is that the European Commission have said the only deal that's available to us is the one that the Prime Minister is recommending to the House? Well, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right on that uh, last point and, the, uh, and the, the question of the withdrawal agreement and it not being available to be reopened was made clear, uh, reiterated again by the European uh, Council, by the EU Council in its decision of yesterday. Um, it, it is the case that it is some weeks ago that I first offered the uh, Leader of the Opposition the opportunity to talk and we had uh, an initial meeting. Uh, there was then uh, not the same level of follow-up meetings and the same level of interest. I'm, what I'm pleased about is I think there is a, a change in the approach that is being taken. Uh, we are both sitting down seriously, looking at these issues in detail and looking at them constructively. Mr. Nigel Dobbs. Speaker, up until yesterday, the EU was saying very, very clearly that it wouldn't grant an extension unless there was a credible plan, either an election, a referendum, or the prospect of getting a withdrawal agreement through soon. It would not grant an extension, and if it did, there would be stringent conditions. And in fact, neither of those things were held to by the European Union, because when they were faced with the unpalatable choice of a no deal, they backed down. Will the Prime Minister learn the lesson of that? She continues to reiterate what the EU have said about the withdrawal agreement and praise her withdrawal agreement. She and the rest of the front bench voted for changes to the backstop and to the withdrawal agreement, and the Attorney General, in his devastating uh, critique of it, said that it hadn't changed the fundamentals of what was agreed. So can the Prime Minister please examine where she's going with all of this, learn the lessons, and come back with something that can actually get a majority in this House? And would she also, just on the issue of extensions, bear in mind that the current session of Parliament is due to end, I understand, fairly soon. There is some talk around of extending this session beyond two years. And can I say, uh, Mr Speaker, on that point, that I think many in this House, including in this bench, would regard that as something that is not acceptable. What can I say to the right honourable gentleman? Uh, we have consistently sought to change the withdrawal agreement, in particular to change the backstop. He will know full well that we have uh, argued on many occasions for a time limit or a unilateral exit clause or the replacement by alternative arrangements. Uh, before the withdrawal agreement was originally agreed in November, the Government public, uh, pushed consistently for an exit clause from the backstop, but the EU did not agree to it then. After the first meaningful vote, uh, we raised the issue again and we sought to change the withdrawal agreement uh, and pushed for it to be placed, replaced by alternative arrangements. On the 11th of March, we had an exchange of letters between myself and the Presidents of the Commission and the EU Council in January. Uh, on the 11th of March, in Strasbourg, the President of the European Commission and I agreed a package, which means that the EU cannot try to trap the UK in the backstop indefinitely. It is explicitly a breach of the legally binding commitments we have agreed if they do so. And there is a legal commitment that both parties aim to replace the backstop with alternative arrangements by December 2020. But the, the uh, changes at every stage, we have been working to get changes to the withdrawal agreement. The European Union has now has been clear. Now, no. Well, the, the, the right honourable gentleman says that they have uh, that they have backed down. Yes, I did. I did put the case yesterday in relation to conditionality that he refers to in relation to conditionality, and there was discussion around the table about that issue of conditionality, and the and the aspect that I think everybody around the table focused on is that there is only a single tier of membership of the European Union. There is only uh, uh, legally there is only a single tier of membership of the European Union, and they rejected the concept of conditionality on that basis. Sir Oliver Hill. The Prime Minister will recall that uh, in the Conservative manifesto there was a commitment to do negotiate a comprehensive free trade and customs agreement. Yes. Would she agree with me that her political declaration that has been agreed and her discussions with the Labour Party are being conducted in that spirit? 
And will she keep going and try to keep to the timetable that avoids the European elections? Because many of us feel it's time to get this done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I say to my right honourable friend, we are indeed conducting those negotiations in, that, in the spirit that he has set out, and I do indeed want to uh, achieve the timetable that he set. set. Uh, I think many of us across this House believe that it is important to do all we can to, leave, to set in train to ensure that we can leave the European Union before the European parliamentary elections. Yvette Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We're in this difficult situation because the government's approach hasn't worked. And simply going round in the same circles or doing the same things isn't going to solve this either. So it would be helpful to understand how far the Prime Minister is actually prepared to reconsider her red lines. Could she tell the House whether she is now willing to consider a common external tariff with the EU, a key part of any customs union, or does she still rule a common external tariff out? Good question. Good. Can, I, can I say to the Right Honourable Lady, she says, obviously, uh, the House has rejected uh, uh, the Government's plan. The House has also rejected the Opposition's plan. The House has rejected no deal. The House has rejected revocation. The House has rejected second, a second referendum. Uh, so this House, at some stage, needs to come to an agreement on what it can agree on to take this issue forward. I continue, uh, and when people talk about the custom, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the question that the right honourable gentleman, a uh, right honourable lady, asked. On a customs union, I think there is actually more agreement uh, in relation to a customs union than is often given credit for when the language, different language, is used. We've been very clear. We've been very clear that we, we've been very clear that we want to obtain the benefits of a customs union: no tariffs, no rules of origin checks, and and uh, no quotas, while being able to operate our own independent trade policy. That has been. We have been very clear about this. The Labour Party has said they want to say in trade policy. The question is how we ensure that we can provide for uh, this country to be in charge of its trade policy in the future. John Barron. The fact remains that we would have left the EU uh, by now on, by, on WTO terms if the Prime Minister had not extended deadlines. The investment decisions underpinning our strong economic performance in recent years have been taken in the full knowledge that we could be leaving on WTO terms. Will the Prime Minister therefore show more confidence and commit to this House that if this Parliament does not pass a deal, we will be leaving on WTO terms, terms by which we profitably trade with many countries outside the EU? I say to, uh, to my honourable friend that I know, and he has uh, continued to champion the uh, concept of leaving without a deal with the European Union. I believe it is important for this country that we are able to leave in an orderly way. Uh, he references WTO terms. Of course, we, we trade with many countries across the world, not on WTO terms, but on the terms that are determined by the EU trade agreements with those, with those countries. Um, what I, but actually, leaving without a deal is not just about our trade arrangements. It is about other issues. It is about our security as a country as well. There are other matters that uh, a deal will cover. I be continue to believe that leaving with a deal in an orderly way is in the best interests of this country, and that's what I'm pursuing. In the midst of these important and inevitably contentious exchanges, can I ask the House to join me in warmly welcoming in the gallery today, former Speaker of the New Zealand Parliament, David Carter, accompanied by Deputy Speaker of the Parliament, the Honourable Anne Tolley MP. It's a, a great delight to welcome you both. You come from a country that we regard as a great friend, and David, you've been a great friend to us and to me. Welcome. Kate Hoey. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, does the Prime Minister not take any responsibility for the fact that she, a Conservative Unionist Prime Minister, signed up to this backstop originally without ensuring herself that she would get support in Parliament for it. Now we're in a situation where the only part, the only vote that went through this with a big majority was the Brady Amendment. 
has she really done her best to ensure that we cannot get the backstop removed? It must be removed before this House will ever support her withdrawal agreement. We have at every stage uh, taken this issue of the backstop. We have been arguing with the, with the European Union in relation to this issue. We did take the Brady Amendment as a result of the uh, decision that was taken by this House. We took that uh, issue in, back into the European Union. The changes that we saw in Strasbourg, the legally binding changes that were obtained in that Strasbourg uh, uh, agreement in Strasbourg between myself and the President of the European uh, Commission, uh, were a direct result of reflecting the views of this House. This Government has been clear that not only is there an accelerated timetable to uh, determine alternative arrangements that can replace the backstop, we, we have actually committed to putting money into the work that will ensure that we have those alternative arrangements to replace the backstop. Uh, the Right Honourable Lady knows my view is that the backstop uh, should never be used, it need never be used, and we need to ensure that we have the relationship in the future. That is why the future relationship is the important way of a sustainable, sustainably ensuring that we are meeting all our obligations, including those in relation to a border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, of course the Government continues in office thanks to the support of our confidence and supply partners. In the event that the withdrawal agreement is pushed through unamended over the heads of those partners, will the Prime Minister be seeking the confidence of the Labour Party? Can I say to my honourable friend, I, I recognise that in this House, reaching across the, uh, the divide between the government and opposition front benches to attempt to come to an agreement on a matter is not usual practice. It is, I think, probably um, virtually unprecedented in the conditions in which we're doing it uh, today. But I believe, I believe it is in the national interest for this House to deliver on the result of the referendum for this House to deliver Brexit for the British people and to do so in an orderly way. I have now voted three times to leave the European Union with a deal. I want to see this House, by a majority, voting to leave the European Union with a deal, and that's the work we're, we're uh, carrying on, and that's where we try to find agreement across this House. Anna Subri. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I welcome this extension because it provides time for a people's vote and I agree yeah, with the words yeah, yeah. of the right honourable gentleman for Leeds Central when he says it's the only way out of the crisis and to end the uncertainty. Mr Speaker it won't have escaped you that a number of honourable members have heard the word her compromise what are the red lines that she set down which she now intends to rub out. Prime Minister please Answer those, those questions. Which of your red lines are you now prepared to rub out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say to the Right Honourable Lady that the whole point of sitting down and negotiating and trying to agree, come to an agreement is that both sides are exploring where that point of agreement may be. Those are the discussions we're having. We're entering into them seriously. We're entering into them seriously and... and we're entering, oh, rub out, rub out. I suggest that the Right Honourable Lady looks at the moves that the Government has already made. In Dr Andrew Murison. The Government, Leo Varadkar, Michelle Barnier and Angela Merkel have all said that there will be no hard border, even in the event of no deal. So can we now put the idea of a Northern Ireland forever backstop out of its misery and work on mitigating an upfront customs union if a customs union is the price of Labour support for getting something approximating Brexit over the line. Can I just say to my honourable friend that in fact and I have obviously talked with a number of those that he has quoted in relation to this issue of a border, that the European Union has been very clear that the rules of the European Union must be applied at the border in the event that there was no deal. 
That is absolutely clear from the European Union, and some of the other comments have been taken out of context in the interpretation that has been, uh, been given to them. Um, I, on this issue of a customs union, I come back to the position I set out earlier. We want to see the benefits of a customs union. In fact, that is in the political declaration of no tariffs, no quotas, and no rules of origin checks. We also want to see, and was reflected in the, uh, in the um, political declaration, uh, an independent trade policy. The Labour Party has a position of a, uh, the benefits of a customs union with a say in trade policy. Um, we are very clear that the benefits of a customs union can be obtained uh, while ensuring that we have the freedom to make those trade deals around the rest of the world that we want to do as an independent country. Ben Bradshaw. Can I uh, also thank the Prime Minister on behalf of my constituents in Exeter for ensuring that this country does not crash out of the European Union without a deal tomorrow uh, in the national interest, and I thank her for that. But does she also not recognise in the national interest that the only way out of this gridlock is to now give this decision back to the people, give them a confirmatory vote on her Brexit deal? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have to say to the right honourable gentleman, I think the way out of this gridlock is for this House to identify the uh, deal that it can agree, that it can take forward, that it can get to, uh, that can command a majority of this House, because I think it is for this House to deliver on the result of the referendum that took place in 2016. Sarah Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, the Prime Minister has won the respect of the European Union leaders, and that's really important that we have good relations with our near neighbours and allies. It's essential for our prosperity and our security. So, would I urge the Prime Minister to ignore the bullies on our back benches and stick to your guns and deliver that Brexit that in our manifesto so well described by the Leader of the House. Yeah. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for uh, her intervention and can I say that we are aiming to deliver, uh, deliver what I believe people in this country voted for which is that Brexit that does protect jobs and, and livelihoods, does protect our security, does protect our union, but also ensures that we bring an end to free movement, uh, that we're no longer under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, that we're no longer sending vast sums of money to the European Union every year. That is what we are aiming to deliver, and that is what I want to see. Uh, a, a deal that enables us to do that is what I want to see gaining a majority in this House. Ms. Savile Roberts. And I am grateful for advance sight of the statement. 27 leaders decided the UK's fate last night while the Prime Minister waited for their decision outside. Seven of those leaders represent countries whose populations are smaller than that of Wales. Yet we are told here in Westminster that Wales is too small, too poor to have a seat at the table. Does the Prime Minister agree that Wales will be? best served in a union that treats its members as equals, yeah. rather than staying in this self-harming union of inequality. Yeah. 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 I say to the Honourable Lady that, as she knows very well, we work with the devolved administrations uh, across the United Kingdom in taking, forward, in taking forward the issues that are of particular concern to uh, the various parts of the United Kingdom in determining what is the right uh, what is the right way forward. We entered the European Union as one United Kingdom and we will leave the European Union as one United Kingdom. We have a collective responsibility to deliver. The rational, responsible, practical way forward is to take the withdrawal agreement with the majority through this House and then move on with the best possible customs arrangements that will satisfy most people, including, I believe, the majority of the people in Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, can I say to my honourable hon friend, he is absolutely right. Uh, I believe it is important for us to deliver on the vote of the referendum, but as he's reminded the House, of course, uh, the two main parties in this uh, chamber, both campaigns. that Brexit, and that's what we should be looking to do. Liz Kendall. Prime Minister, we need to use this extension for a purpose. Yeah. One more heave isn't good enough, yeah, and it right. won't work. Absolutely right. Neither will trying to con people 
that we can have all the benefits of a customs union and still have a completely independent trade policy. So can I ask her once again, does she acknowledge, even if it's not what she wants, putting her withdrawal agreement to the public is the way to break this Brexit deadlock and get the resolution our country desperately needs? I, I genuinely believe that the way to break the Brexit deadlock is for this House to be able to agree on a deal that it will deliver on the vote of the British people. Boone! Thank you, Mr Speaker. At Prime Minister's questions on the 20th of March, when I asked the Prime Minister why she was ex- seeking to extend Article 50, having promised on 108 times not to do so, she said... As Prime Minister, I could not consider a delay further beyond the 30th of June. We now, sir, have an extension up to the 31st of October. Prime Minister, how are you going to honour that commitment you gave to the House on the 20th of March? Can I, can I, can I say to my honourable friend, this House and I can honour that commitment by voting for a deal that enables us to leave before the 30th of June. Matt McFadden. The Prime Minister has now applied for and been granted two extensions to the Article 50 period, and she did this to avoid the consequences of a no-deal Brexit, consequences which were laid out by the Cabinet Secretary two weeks ago. Rising food prices, shortages of food, stockpiling medicine, huge damage to manufacturing and the weakening of our national security. Yet for two years she talked up this outcome saying no deal is better than a bad deal. This irresponsible rhetoric has helped to normalise these consequences in the minds of the public. Does she regret talking up no deal and legitimising an outcome which she knows is bad for the country and by the acceptance of these extensions she is desperate to avoid it. I, I stand by what I have consistently said in relation to no deal be- better than a bad deal, but we have a good deal. I say to the right honourable gentleman, I have voted on three occasions in this House for us to leave the European Union with a deal. And I think it's all members of this House who wish to deliver on leaving the European Union need to think about how we can come together and find a majority that enables us to do just that. I voted to leave with a deal. I hope the right honourable gentleman will want to vote to leave with a deal in the future too. Julia Lopez. Since the first defeat of the deeply flawed withdrawal agreement, the government seems to have focused on how to make all other options worse rather than how to make the agreement better. Given that this narrow strategy continues to fail and cross-party talks may not bear fruit, what assurances and outline did the Prime Minister give our EU friends on her Plan B, such that this latest extension becomes one with a purpose? My honourable friend is absolutely right, and this was a point that was made earlier about the uh, expression that the European Union had given that they would want a purpose for any extension. I was clear with them about the... uh, approach that we are taking, the talks that we are having with the uh, opposition, but also, as I made clear in my statement last week, that uh, if we are not able to come to an agreement with the opposition such that there would be a a proposal that would meet a majority across this House, we would move into into a means of ensuring that this House was able to vote on options and come to a decision as to what its its preferred option as to what uh, was able to get a majority across this House. And the extension is there to enable us to put that process into place. Caroline Lucas. Speaker, a six-month delay is just 74 sitting days. To waste it on a Tory leadership contest would be an unforgivable act of self-indulgence, an issue that she might, for once, agree with me about. But she's wasted the last two years. Will she undertake not to waste it one day further by supporting the immediate establishment of a House Business Committee so that we might just have a chance of have a process that is in the interests of the country rather than in the interests of the Tory party, with more votes being pulled at the last minute and more game playing? Can I say to the the Honourable Lady, uh, no, I think that the arrangements that we have in relation to, uh, obviously arrangements in relation to business of this House have been changing in uh, in recent days through decisions that have been taken by this this House. 
that uh, I do not believe that the establishment of a House Business Committee is the right way forward. Mark Francois. first extension was based on the fact that we would ratify the withdrawal agreement, and in what was effectively MV3, we turned it down again. And now she's been given another extension, longer than she asked for, yet again on the basis that we will somehow ratify the withdrawal agreement. Perseverance is a virtue, but sheer obstinacy is not. So, Prime Minister... <laughs> here, here. <laughs> If, as I suspect, the Leader of the Opposition strings you along in these talks and then finds a pretext to collapse them and then throws in a confidence motion, what will you do then? People with tax cuts, a modern industrial strategy, 1.9 million more children in good and outstanding schools. We're delivering for people, and that's why this party should remain in government. Stephen Doughty. It's extension. I welcome the ruling out of a catastrophic no deal, and I welcome the fact that there are talks going on between our two parties because I think it is important that we try and find consensus and attempt to break the deadlock. But can I warn the Prime Minister that attempting to decouple the issue of a, a, a deal? from yeah. the issue of whether that goes back to the people for their confirmation will not be acceptable to many, many people on these benches yeah. and indeed an increasing yeah. number on her own. And will she recognise that the only way to break the deadlock will be a confirmatory vote and putting this issue back to the people? Yeah. Well, the, the honourable gentleman will have heard the answers I, I gave earlier in response to uh, similar questions about this question of a second, a second referendum. I do genuinely believe we gave a vote to the British people in 2016. I do genuinely believe we should be liv- delivering on that. I think actually there is a view across this House that we should be delivering on Brexit. The question is finding uh, an agreement across this House that enables us to do that. To- Confirm that if we were to come together across this house and support a deal in a timely fashion after Easter, there would be every reason that we would, be, that we would not need to hold the European elections. Yeah. Yeah. Honourable friend is right. Obviously, it's a very tight timetable. But if we were able to uh, have uh, an agreement that commanded a majority across this house, uh, and uh, obviously we have to get the legislation through, but I believe my ambition and uh, aim would still be to be able to do that such that we do not need to hold the European parliamentary elections. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whenever the Prime Minister is asked about a second referendum, she's keen to remind us that that's been defeated twice in this House. But of course her withdrawal agreement has been defeated three times in this House. And on, on the second outing for a second referendum in this House, it got 280 votes, which is considerably better than her withdrawal agreement got on its second outing in this House. And in fact, if support for a second referendum grew at the same rate as support for her withdrawal agreement, it would win outright if it got a third vote. So, in the number of options that she intends to put to this House, if she can't get an agreement with Her Majesty's opposition, in recognition of that democratic fact, will she include a second referendum? The Honourable Lady, that she is again also actually talking about process here in relation to a second referendum. What this House needs to agree is the basis on which we can leave the European Union. The, 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 and that is the, it is the substance of that that is the nature of the discussions that we are having with the opposition. Damien Green. Many in this place, but more importantly, many exporting businesses and farmers will welcome the fact that they are no longer facing tariffs that would threaten their survival, which would have happened if we crashed out with no deal tomorrow night. So, to that extent, the Council conclusions are very welcome. But can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree with me that, contrary to many of the voices from opposition benches, a second referendum wouldn't be the end of the process, it would be the start of the process. And in the current climate, it will be much more likely to lead to greater division in this country rather than the healing that we desperately need.
Right. I, am, I am concerned that a second referendum would increase division in our society, increase division across this country, just at the time when we do need to be bringing people together. We can bring people together by agreeing the way in which we can leave the European Union, getting on with it and delivering for people on their vote. Peter Kyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following on from the right honourable member for Ashford's question, it seems that our body politic is increasingly fearful of the electorate. Mm. We are held hostage to the 2016 referendum and other public ballots. And isn't it true that the tone and conduct of us as politicians and her as a leader of our country is increasingly important and as, apo- as important as the policies themselves? Is now not the time that we sit back and we reflect and we start to investigate how we can use public ballots to bring people together as a country, yeah. not run away scared of public with rigour and focus on fact rather than division itself. I I recognise the the passion and seriousness with which the Honourable Gentleman uh, has uh, campaigned and championed the concept of of, uh, second referendum uh, in this House and elsewhere. I simply say to him, nobody is running scared of the electorate. Uh, we did. We gave the electorate the opportunity. We gave the electorate the opportunity to determine the fate of this country in relation to its membership of the European Union, and they made and they made a decision on that. They made a decision that we should leave the European Union. So I think that in fact, it, it, there would be many people if we were to go back to the uh, to the people in a second referendum. There would be many people who would fear that that was actually a sign of bad faith in relation to their politicians, and I think could damage our democracy. Richard Harrington. Speaker, I'd like to thank my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, for all of her efforts that have taken place to remove the nonsense of No Deal from this agenda. In her statement, she mentioned that um, if the talks um, fall, which I certainly hope is not the case, that she'll put to the House a series of votes to determine which course to pursue. Could she confirm to me that there will be a voting system of preference which allows the House to finally decide on one solution to this problem? uh, What I have uh, said and what uh, is the intention of the Government is that if the talks with the Opposition fail to find a point of agreement between us uh, that we believe will get a majority across this House, we would work with the Opposition to identify options and uh, votes that will be put to this House to find a way of determining a single result. There are a number of ways in which it is possible to do that. I think what would be important would be ensuring that whatever uh, system was chosen, were we in that position, whatever voting system was chosen, was genuinely going to come to a, a proper reflection of the views of this House. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister knows that uh, full membership of the single market is the only way we can guarantee workers' rights, guarantee the integrity of the union, do something for the services sector, which is 80% of the economy. A standalone customs union <laughs> simply doesn't cut it. So in these options that will be presented to, to us if uh, the talks don't... Work. Can she guarantee that full membership of the single market? Uh, full membership of the single market is the only way to achieve the uh, benefits that he has referred to. It's particularly important as we leave the European Union that we have a care for our services sector. He's right. Given the significant uh, 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 extent to which that uh, plays a role in our economy. But actually, that flexibility and the and maintaining and recognising the importance of the City of London, particularly in financial services, and the risk that is borne here in the United Kingdom, uh, leads us to want to see that greater flexibility in relation to services and on, on workers' rights. Can I say to him, uh, it is not the case that the only way to ensure that we uh, maintain and enhance work.
the legislation through and do what uh, both she and other honourable members on that side of the House and honourable and right honourable members on this side of the House did at the last general election, which is stand, stood on a manifesto to deliver Brexit. Martin Vickers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, my right honourable friend in her statement spoke of the, of the British people being frustrated with the present situation. I can certainly confirm that that uh, applies to my consi- uh, constituents, but they're also angry and they feel that our country has been humiliated. Can um, the Prime Minister give them at least a crumb of comfort by giving them an absolute assurance that there will n- most certainly never ever be another application for an extension? And would she agree that uh, the one benefit from the extension is that it gives us even more time to prefer for no deal? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend, can I first of all thank him for the support that he has recently shown for the deal? Uh, because the best, the best way that we can give that confidence to his constituents is by ensuring that in this House we agree a deal and then we're able actually to deliver uh, uh, the uh, leaving of the European Union. Geraint Davis. Mr Speaker, she said a moment ago that uh, the European Parliament can vote to ratify the deal before this Parliament and presumably uh, during that interlude there will be further negotiations to change the political declaration. So can she tell me how she intends to entrench any agreements in good faith uh, between the two parties in the political declaration, if not uh, by a public confirmatory vote which will make those political declarations sustainable rather than ripped up by a future leader. I say to the uh, honourable gentleman that we have already indicated the uh, intention that we have to ensure that Parliament has a a greater role in the negotiations uh, in relation to the future relationship in future by accepting, as we said on the 29th of March, the amendment in the name of his honourable friend, the member for Stoke-on-Trent Central. Um, And uh, we can also look, uh, the elements of this are about the political declaration. There are also elements that are about what we do here in this House, in UK legislation, to ensure that we're entrenching uh, objectives for that future relationship. Of course, the negotiation still has to take place with the EU on that uh, future relationship, but there are many steps that we can take here in the United Kingdom to give confidence to members of this House. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister's uh, resolve... Uh, uh, especially with her lack of sleep, in trying to persuade this House to come up with a solution that is acceptable to our Brexit problem is to be highly commended. In return, will she continue to resolve to press our European partners for the only thing that's had a majority in this House, namely the Brady uh, uh, Amendment uh, combined with the Malt House Compromise? Well, can I say to my right honourable friend that the position in relation to the withdrawal agreement has been reiterated by the, uh, by the European Union Council. Um, but of course, the point of the Brady Amendment was that alternative arrangements should be in place that could replace the backstop. We are, uh, and one of the things that we have agreed with the European Union is a fast a timetable for work on those alternative arrangements. And as I indicated earlier in response to a question, uh, the government has committed money uh, funding for the work that is necessary to ensure that we will be in that position such that at the end of December 2020 the backstop would not need to be used and if interim arrangements were necessary uh, those alternative arrangements would be available. Patrick Grady. Speaker, the 78% of my constituents who voted Remain don't want an extension, they just want this business stopped. The way to break this deadlock is either with a new referendum, a new House of Commons or a new Prime Minister. So which is it going to be? (laughs) <laughs> Prime Minister. I say to the honourable gentleman, he knows full well uh, that I believe it is the duty of this House, I believe it is the duty of this Parliament to deliver on the result of the referendum that took place in 2016, to do that with a deal, to leave the European Union in an orderly way, and that's what we're working to do. Charles Vara. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This House very much appreciates the Prime Minister's desire to leave with a deal. However, the Prime Minister will appreciate that a responsible government must prepare for all eventualities. There are members in this House who do not favour a no-deal scenario because they feel that the country is not ready to leave in such circumstances. Given that we are now in an extended territory in terms of leaving the EU, would the Prime Minister kindly give an assurance to the House that she has given instructions to the Government to prepare for a no-deal in the event that we do reach that eventuality, 
and I hope that she will also appreciate that by doing so, it will not only strengthen our position as far as the EU is concerned with further negotiations, but also if we do have to leave on a no-deal basis, we can do so, do so with confidence and without fear. I say to uh, my right honourable friend um, that it is right, as we no, have not yet agreed a deal on the basis on which we are leaving the European Union, that we continue to make preparations for all eventualities. But I will also say this to my right honourable friend that in a no deal situation, it would not simply be a question of what the United Kingdom government had done, it would be a question of what governments in the European Un- other governments in the European Union had done. Uh, so while any preparations would be made, Made to mitigate the impact of no deal. Of course, there would be elements that will be out with the control of the UK government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister can be relieved. I'm not going to ask to dip into her stash of cough sweets. But I do want to follow up on something she just said to the member for Meriden about one of the things that she wants to do with the time now available to her, which is to hear what businesses and the public think about all the things in front of us. Does she recognise that the fairest, most inclusive and most democratic way to do that would be to learn from other countries and have a citizens' assembly? Well, I uh, thank the uh, Honourable Lady for her question, particularly given the uh, uh, state of her throat and voice. Um, But I think we are obviously looking at establishing, as we have indicated, uh, a a more, uh, if you like, a more formal forum, which it is possible to bring uh, people together across. We have been listening to business, of course. We have been talking and listening to trade unions and civil society, but a more formal way of uh, doing that and uh, arrangements for that will be set out in due course. Well, Neil, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister accept the very clear message I got from my fellow commuters from Chislehurst this morning, who I think are very representative of my constituency, that she has done the right thing by the country in avoiding a no deal, which would have done real harm to their real world jobs and businesses? Also, that it is no harm, in fact, a good thing in the real world to seek compromise and to reach out, uh, and that rigidity and fundamentalism is actually what does not work in the real world, and thirdly, that they want her to have our support in continuing to see this through and have the matter done. Well, can I Minister. thank my, my honourable friend for his, and thank uh, the commuters from Chislehurst for their <laughs> comments that they have brought into, into the House. It's absolutely right. I think people recognise the importance of compromise. They recognise the importance of working this through, finding a solution and getting it done. I'm sure the commuters of Chislehurst were greatly encouraged to be accompanied on their journey by the honourable and learned gentleman. I feel sure of that. Seema Malhotra. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister, three years after the referendum, is finally engaged in cross-party talks. But she may recall, as long ago as the week that she took office, I wrote her calling for cross-party working in the national interest and for her to urgently engage the country through a national convention on how we move forward. So we've committed Brexiteers now, like Peter Oborn, expressing concern about where we have reached and the risks of Brexit for our economy and our union. Who does she plan to engage in the more formal forum she has described in order to engage the public in how we move forward and use the next six months wisely to bring our divided country together? We do want to bring our divided country together. First of all, in order to do that, we need to have agreement across this House for a deal that can ensure that we can deliver Brexit and then move on to that second stage where we will indeed be having that that commitment, both in terms of the responsibilities and and, uh, involvement of this House, but also of businesses, trade unions and civil society. Richard Graham. Given the collective failure of Parliament to secure the withdrawal agreement bill and allow us to leave the European Union so far. The Prime Minister is absolutely right to seek cross-party consensus, secure an extension of Article 50 and urge us to resolution of this as quickly as possible to avoid the European Union elections. In that process, the wording of customs arrangements in the future political declaration is likely to be key. And I've asked the chairman of our select committee for leaving the EU to distribute a briefing on this. But could my right honourable friend also organise for leading representatives of major business organisations to brief members across the House on the importance of the withdrawal agreement bill and what their views on the customs union are? 
Yeah. Uh, my honourable friend has made a very interesting and important uh, suggestion. I will certainly look very carefully at that. I think it is important that members of this House have uh, as much information as possible when they are making decisions on these matters, and certainly the voice of business will be an important part of that. Dr. Reba Hark. Mr. Speaker, I must thank the Prime Minister for having me round for much more agreeable cross party dialogue uh, exactly a week ago. It feels like six months ago than the exchanges that we have uh, forcibly, the forcibly confrontational exchanges that we have in here. And I congratulate her on her achievement of the wee hours yesterday night or this morning, whenever that was. Um, in recognition of the spirit of um, reaching consensus that she talked about, and we discussed last week how all our constituents just want this stalemate moved on from. I'm now prepared to allow her deal to pass, subject to the small rider that it has attached to the end of it, a ratificatory referendum to check in that the will of the people in 2016 is the will of the people now. And I feel that would imbue it with democratic renewal. That is my compromise, Mr Speaker. It's a big climb down from what I've said all the way up to now. I just wondered if she'd tell us what is hers. Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady, and I was happy to have a discussion with her last week, uh, and can I just say to her, I think in her question to me, she referenced the need that constituents feel to be able to move on from this situation. Can I just say to her gently that I don't think holding a second referendum would enable people to move on. It would have yeah. further discussion, yeah. further division. Yeah. Jeremy Lefroy. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for all that she has done? over the last weeks, days yeah. and months, yeah. and for what she <coughs> achieved yesterday. Would she also join me in thanking Sir Tim Barrow, um, the UK's representative uh, to the European Union and his staff, and indeed many of the fellow leaders at the European Council who show great goodwill towards the United Kingdom in coming uh, to this agreement and listening to the points that she made. They are our partners for the future, whatever that holds. Minister. I say to my honourable friend, I'm very happy to uh, uh, congratulate and welcome Sir Tim Barrow and all his staff on all the work that they have done. They have been putting long hours in on behalf of the United Kingdom and uh, made a really important contribution to the work that we've been doing with the EU in negotiating uh, this, uh, this particular deal. And can I also say that he's absolutely right. Um, those EU leaders were willing to come. Some broke off election campaigning. Um, some won. Uh, 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 Restricted a, a trip that he was due to make to Vietnam was making to Vietnam in order to come round the table to get that agreement yesterday, and I was grateful to them for that. They are our partners. They will continue to be our partners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> break. When uh, two years ago the Prime Minister was devising a Brexit that reflected the will of the people, I assume it didn't include many elements of Labour policy. So, if the Prime Minister agrees a, a blue-red Brexit with the uh, leader of the opposition. It cannot, by definition, reflect her interpretation of the will of the people. Doesn't that make the case for a people's vote unassailable? Minister. Can, I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, I think there are actually many things and plenty of things on which uh, we agree with the opposition on this matter. Ending free movement, protecting jobs, uh, up, uh, upholding and enhancing workers' rights. These are all things that, uh, that we agree on. So there is much that we do agree on. We are working to see how we can come to a final agreement between us that would get a majority across this House. Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Ten years ago, European elections were held in the heat of the expenses scandal, and many voters chose to stay at home. Two members of the British National Party were sent to represent our country, despite the fact that less than 3% of voters actually voted for them, and despite the abhorrent policies of that party, which denied membership to anyone whose face was not white. So can I urge my right hon. friend, the Prime Minister, and the Leader of the Opposition to do everything they can to resolve this impasse so that we don't need to fight European elections, but if we do, to fight them with a positive attitude from the centre and not to hand a platform to extremists yeah. again. Yeah. 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 Well, Prime my my hon. Friend makes a very important point, and I think I do believe, and I would hope that this is a view that is shared across the House, 
that we should be working to try to ensure that we do not need to hold those European parliamentary elections, that we are able to get an agreement that can see a majority across this House so that we can leave uh, and not hold those, uh, those elections. And I think it is very important, uh, as she says, that we do not see platforms being given to extremists. Yes. Dr Wall Williams. Uh, Mr Speaker, when there are problems in a relationship, we encourage couples to keep on talking. When there's an industrial dispute, negotiations are always best. When there's a dispute between countries, we encourage people to talk. Why does the Prime Minister think that having a binder, binding public confirmatory vote would be so divisive? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, uh, can I say and his uh, uh, exemplification of when there are issues of uh, which people disagree, the ability to come together and talk is an important element, which is exactly what I'm doing with the, uh, with the opposition at the moment. Um, but as I've said before, I think that, the, that one of the reasons why I think that a second referendum would be divisive is because I think there are many people who felt that they voted for a conclusion in the first referendum and would feel that uh, they would lose their trust in politicians if we failed to deliver on that. Matt Warman. 76% of my constituents voted to leave the European Union and every day this Parliament fails to deliver on that is another day that their faith in democracy is diminished. So can I say to the Prime Minister that this is about more than Brexit and that a second referendum would be a hammer blow to that faith in democracy and we cannot let that happen. No. My, my honourable friend um, speaks powerfully on this issue, and uh, as I have, uh, have indicated in answer to a number of questions, I believe we do have a duty in this House to deliver on the vote of the British people to deliver Brexit for them. Kevin Olin Rake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> in last week's indicative votes, the front bench opposi opposition front bench moved on their key red lines and supported a solution that does not include a permanent customs union, but instead includes a customs arrangement. Now that we're virtually on the same page, isn't now the time to put party politics aside and work cross-party to agree a deal in the national interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I say to my honourable friend, I think it is that the public expect no less of us that at a time such as this, when there has been this deadlock, that we are willing to work together, politicians are willing to sit down and talk together and find a solution, and that's exactly what we want to do. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To date, the Prime Minister has failed to move on her red lines, so has not, in sincerity, reached out across this Parliament, <laughs> let alone this country. Parliament, our nation is stressed, it's hurting, it's dividing and it's breaking. So how will the Prime Minister use the time available to her to bring our country together and heal the divides in our nation? And will she work across the House to do this? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, that is exactly what we are doing. We are having talks in a very positive, constructive atmosphere, looking in detail. Of course, we've both started, as I say, I think there's a lot that we agree on. Um, there are some differences between us, but we're working to find if we can find agreement between these. She talks, the Honourable Lady talks about the country and bringing the country together. I think a first step in bringing the country together is being able to bring this House together to find a deal so that we can deliver Brexit. <laughs> Mike Wood. Speaker, uh, my right honourable friend is aware of my view of a lengthy extension, but the extension period that she's negotiated ends if an agreement is ratified. What guarantees has she secured that uh, the European Parliament will ratify any agreement in a timely manner without unnecessary delay? The, um, it is clear what has been uh, agreed, as I un understand it, is that there is a process by which the European Parliament, as I indicated earlier, would be able to ratify prior to the United Kingdom ratifying. Of course, that ratification could be subject to us then uh, ratifying to enable that the whole process had been completed. Clive Efford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that the Prime Minister seems to have indicated quite clearly that she's not prepared to give at all on her red lines, and she said in her statement that if they cut, we can't come to cross-party agreement, that she wants to bring back soon, so I'd like to know how long is soon, a small number of options before the House. What will be included in those options? Can I, 
say to the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, I have indicated on a number of occasions now that we are working constructively and positively with the opposition to find that point of agreement between us. Um, As I've said, there are many issues. People often talk, for example, on customs about disagreement between us. Actually, we do agree that we want the benefits of a customs union with no tariffs, no rules of origin checks and no quotas. Uh, And he referenced the potential second stage if it is not possible to come to that agreement. We would be be, uh, working with the opposition to identify those options and how to take those forward. Derek Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. People want and expect us to get on with the job, and I believe that trust in our democratic system is being eroded eroded at an alarming rate. Assuming that the Prime Minister can get the meaningful vote for part approved, is it still the PM's view, the Prime Minister's view, that the transition period will end at the end of 2020? Uh, If it was that view, then this this would demonstrate that we are true to our word. It it is certainly my view that that transition period can end at the end of December 2020, and indeed we should work to ensure that it does end at the end of December 2020. Uh, And of course, the sooner we can get a deal ratified through this Parliament, then the more likely we are to be able to meet that timetable. Dr Lisa Cameron. Many thanks, Mr Speaker. As Easter approaches, my churches across East Kilbride, Straven and Les Mahago have expressed grave concern regarding growing intolerance towards EU citizens in the UK as a result of the Brexit discord and extreme right-wing views. So what more can the Prime Minister do to denounce this intolerance, to reassure our EU citizens that they are valued? We want their contribution because they improve our society for the better. Well, I'm very happy to echo that uh, comment that the Honourable Lady has made. EU citizens make a valuable contribution to our society and to our economy. Uh, we are the, the better for their contribution, the contribution that they make. Uh, that is why the government has been clear in guaranteeing and protecting the rights of those EU citizens. Uh, we are one community and we should move forward as one community. Yeah. Raymond Chishti. Mr Speaker, paragraph 10 of the conclusion says further extension cannot be allowed to undermine the regular functionings of the institutions. Prime Minister, that is exactly what would happen if we have the European elections take place. We would get far-right extremist individuals who were, who were protesting outside number 10 on the 29th of March, exploiting people's grievances for their own interest. Sitting on the Home Affairs Select Committee, Prime Minister, and you know this well, over 100 live investigations take place on extremism, and most of them are far-right extremists. Taking part in those European elections would give legitimacy to some of these uh, vile individuals and their beliefs. Prime Minister, my constituents say, please, please deliver by the 22nd. We don't take part in European elections. If not, this has gone on long enough. Deliver on the democratic mandate which the people have voted on and leave uh, without a deal. I say to my honourable friend, I I absolutely agree that we should be working to ensure that we can leave the European Union with a deal without having to hold those European parliamentary elections. Diana Johnson. Mr Speaker, I'm sad to say that no matter uh, how the Prime Minister dresses up last night as a bilateral negotiation, it was actually a humiliation for this country on her watch. And I wondered, in the spirit of saying that she wants to compromise, can she just confirm for me and the many of my constituents who have been in touch about whether she is actually going to move off any of those red lines that she's put forward? Prime Minister. To the Honourable Lady, we have already shown our willingness to move when issues have been put to us as a government. We've done that on some of the issues, for example, around uh, around workers' rights. These are still issues that uh, may wish to be discussed with us, but we've already shown our willingness to move on issues. (laughs) Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I compliment the Prime Minister on her stamina? And can I and can I thank her for making the future of the union? paramount in her considerations. The last thing we need in Scotland is another divisive referendum. And I know that the people of Stirling want us to come together and resolve this issue. They want us to compromise. They want us to be grown up about this. Does the Prime Minister agree with this sentiment from Liz Cameron, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce? She said it would be a disgrace if any of those who claim to represent our citizens, if, come the 31st of October, the same late-night drama plays out all over again. 
Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right. I think the responsibility for all of us on this House now is to come together to find a way through to ensure that we can uh, get this done. And Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has repeatedly set her face against a second referendum, but she has also said compromise will be required, and that she is um, what she is willing to compromise on is subject to negotiations with the Labour Party. If that is the case, how can she so categorically rule out a people's vote? And why is she apparently re removing that option as part of any future negotiations and compromise conversations? Prime Minister. I, say, uh, I refer the Honourable Lady to the answers I've given earlier in response to questions about a, a second referendum. Yes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, businesses have been increasing their stocks of raw materials, components and finished goods in order to avoid the damaging uh, disruption of a no-deal departure from the EU. And in the process, they have incurred substantial additional costs on warehouse housing and have been tying up capital uh, that otherwise would be available, available for investment. What advice would the Prime Minister give to businesses as to how long they need to continue with that process? The Minister. Can I say to uh, my honourable friend, it's absolutely right, of course, to identify the uncertainties that businesses face and the actions that they're taking in the face of those uncertainties. I think what I would say to businesses is that I hope they would see that the government, in reaching out to the opposition, is genuinely trying to find a way through this and being able to do that within uh, a timescale that gives them the certainty as soon as possible. <sighs> Justin Matters. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Given um, the government's motion on the EU on Tuesday could only attract the support of about 40% of her own party's MPs, uh, what guarantees do we have, should uh, she reach agreement with the Leader of the Opposition, that any deal could actually get the support of her own party? Well, I think, uh, I think the uh, Honourable Gentleman will look and see that actually support for the withdrawal agreement has been growing on this side of the House. We are looking to see if we can find that, as uh, he knows, that point of agreement with the opposition that would uh, truly command a majority of this House and enable us to ensure that we can get the legislation necessary through. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I thank the Prime Minister for listening to the House and working with the European Union to avoid a no deal? A no deal would have cost manufacturing greatly, and Jaguar Land Rover, which is centred around my constituency, £1.2 billion a year, which would threaten its very viability. However, does the Prime Minister agree with her Secretary of State for International Trade that a customs union? Would actually, between the UK and the EU, would actually be the worst of both worlds. What, uh, what we are looking for is to ensure that we can uh, obtain the benefits of a customs union that have been identified in the political declaration. Uh, we are continuing to, uh, to move forward on that. Uh, of course, there is the question of uh, trade policy. We believe it is right to have a good trade agreement with the European Union for the future, uh, but also to have good trade agreements and uh, an ability to negotiate those trade agreements with the rest of the world too. Ah, we conclude with a question from the distinguished chair of the Procedure Committee, Charles Walker. It goes without saying that I look forward to joining the Prime Minister in delivering Brexit in Broxbourne. So can I just say to the Prime Minister in concluding this, I have nothing left to say on Brexit <laughs> until at least another week has passed. So will she join the rest of the House in having a few days off next week? Yeah. Yeah. And before she leaves this place tonight, can she suggest to the Chief Whip that he has a few solid 12-hour sleeps as well? <laughs> <laughs> Prime Minister. Can I, can I thank my honourable friend for uh, his sentiments? I'm sure everybody across the whole of this House uh, is looking forward to the opportunity to actually take some time to reflect on the issues that we're dealing with in this House, to do this away from this, uh, away from this chamber, and I will certainly pass his request on to the Chief Whip. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Order. Statement. The Secretary of State for the Home Department. Secretary Sajid Javid. With permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to make a statement on the arrest of Julian Assange. This morning, after nearly seven years inside the Ecuadorian Embassy, Mr Assange was arrested for failing to surrender in relation to his extradition proceedings. He was later also served with a warrant for provisional arrest, pending receipt of a request for extradition to stand trial in the United States on charges relating to computer offences. 
His arrest follows a decision by the Ecuadorian government to bring to an end his presence inside the embassy in London. I am pleased that President Moreno has taken this decision and I extend the UK's thanks to him for resolving this situation. Ecuador's actions recognise that the UK criminal justice system is one in which rights are protected and in which, contrary to what Mr Assange and his supporters may claim, he and his legitimate interests will be protected. This also reflects the improvements of the UK relationship with Ecuador under the government of President Moreno. These are a credit to the leadership of my right honourable friend, the Minister of State for Americas, and to the ongoing hard work of Foreign Office officials, both here in London and Quito. Mr Assange was informed of the decision to bring his presence in the embassy to an end by the Ecuadorian ambassador this morning, shortly before 10 a.m. The Metropolitan Police entered the embassy for the purpose of arresting and removing him. All of the police's activities were carried out pursuant to a formal written invitation signed by the Ecuadorian ambassador and in accordance with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank the Metropolitan Police for the professionalism that they have shown in dealing with the immediate situation and during the last seven years. Both the UK Government and the Ecuadorian Government have become increasingly concerned about the state of Mr Assange's health. The first action of the police following the arrest was to have him medically assessed and deemed fit to detain. The Ecuadorians have made their best efforts to ensure that doctors chosen by him have had access inside the embassy. And while he remains in the custody of the UK, we are now in a position to ensure access to all necessary medical facilities. Proceedings will now begin according to the court timetable. Under UK law, following the provisional arrest, the full extradition papers must be received by the judge within 65 days. A full extradition request would have to be certified by the Home Office before being submitted to the court after which extradition proceedings would begin. At this point, the decision as to whether any statutory bars to extradition apply would be for the UK courts to determine. I will go no further in discussing the details of the accusations against Mr Assange, either in the UK's criminal justice system or in the US. But I am pleased that the situation in the Ecuadorian embassy has finally been brought to an end. Mr Assange will now have the opportunity to contest the charge against him in open court and to have any extradition request considered by the judiciary. It is right that we implement the judicial process fairly and consistently with due respect for equality before the law. I commend this statement to the House. Diane Abbott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Home Secretary for his account of events. On this side of the house, we're glad that Julian Assange will be able to access medical care, treatment and facilities, because there have been worrying reports about his ill health. Of course, at this point, this is all a matter for the courts. But on this side of the house, we want to make the point that the reason we are debating Julian Assange this afternoon, even though the only charge he may face in this country is in relation to his bail hearings, the reason we are debating this this afternoon is entirely to do with the whistleblowing activities of Julian Assange on WikiLeaks. It is this whistleblowing activity into illegal wars, mass murder, murder of civilians and corruption on a grand scale that has put Julian Assange in the crosshairs of the US administration. It is for this reason that they have once more issued an extradition warrant against Mr Assange. The Home Secretary will note that Mr Assange complained to the UN that he was being unlawfully detained as he could not leave the Ecuadorian embassy without being arrested. And in February 2016, the UN panel ruled in his favour, stating that he had been arbitrarily detained and should be allowed to walk free and compensated for his deprivation of liberty. liberty. Mr Assange held that as a significant victory, called the decision binding, but the Foreign Office responded 
by saying this ruling changes nothing. I note it was the Foreign Office that responded, not the Home Office or the Ministry of Justice. The Foreign Office has no responsibility for imprisonment and extradition in this country, but it is, of course, interested in relations with allies and others. We have precedent in this country in relation to requests for extradition to the US when the US authorities raise issues of hacking and national security. I would remind the House of the case of Gary McKinnon. In October 2012, when the, the current Prime Minister was Home Secretary, an extradition request very similar to this one was refused. And we should recall what WikiLeaks actually disclosed. Who can forget the Pentagon video footage of a, mi a missile attack in 2007 in Iraq which killed 18 civilians and two Reuters journalists? It is the monumental amount of leaks such as this that lifted the veil on US-led military operation in a variety of theatres none of which have produced a favourable outcome from the people of those countries. Julian Assange is not being pursued to protect US national security. He is being pursued because he has exposed wrongdoing by US administrations and their military forces. And we only have to look at the treatment of Chelsea Manning to see what awaits him if he's extradited to the US. Ms Manning has already been incarcerated between 2010 to 2017. She was originally sentenced to 35 years. Her indefinite detention now is because she refuses to participate impartial disclosure which would allow whistleblowers to be pursued and not the perpetrators and her human rights and protections as a transgender woman have been completely ignored her human rights as a transgender woman have been completely ignored and I would hope members on the the other side of the house would take that seriously and what it has to do with Julian Assange's case is this could be the type of treatment that he could expect if he's extradited to the US. In this country we have protections for whistleblowers including the public interest disclosure act in 1998 and others even if some of us feel these protections should be more robust. Underpinning this legislation is the correct premise, not that anyone can leak anything they like, but there should be protection afforded to those who take personal risk to disclose wrongdoing where that disclosure serves the public interest. Julian Assange is at risk of extradition to the US precisely because on this side of the House we believe he has disclosed material that is in the utmost public interest. This is now in the hands of the British Law Courts. We have the utmost confidence in the British legal system, but we would say on this side of the House we would be very concerned that on the basis of what we know, Julian Assange was extradited to the US. <laughs> Mr Speaker, can I first of all thank the Right Honourable Lady for her response. Uh, but Mr Speaker, you know, I think the, the whole country, if they listen to her response, they will be pretty astounded by the tone that she has taken. And you know, She talked first of all, she started talking about the reason for uh, Mr Assange's uh, arrest and try to come up with all sorts of justifications herself, which have nothing to do with the reason. The reason Mr Assange has been arrested is because he failed to surrender to a UK court. Yeah. That's why he's been arrested. And there was a provisional arrest warrant, which is subject to extradition proceedings, but that is the usual procedures, procedures under UK law. And there's no one in this country that is above the law. And the right honourable lady, who we should remember wants to be the Home Secretary, is suggesting that we should not apply the rule of law to an individual. That's right, she, she's, she's disagreeing sitting from her position, but she is implying, she's saying actually quite clearly that Mr Assange should be not subject to UK law, and that is something that should worry every, any British citizen should she ever become Home Secretary. I, I, I will, she, she, can, she can intervene later if, she, if the Speaker allows her, that's, uh, that's possible, but I, I do wish to finish my comments in response uh, to hers. She also talked about the UN, as though the UN 
had some opinion on this, and I am sure it is not intentional, but uh, she, she would be at risk of uh, not giving quite correct information, Mr Speaker, because the UN has no view on the Assange case. I think what she was actually referring to was the view of a group of uh, independent persons that uh, have decided to look at this case. They do not speak for the UN in any way whatsoever. Uh, it's a small group of uh, individuals where, who came up with a deeply flawed opinion, su suggesting that somehow Mr. Assange was indefinitely detained in the UK by the British authorities, when in fact the only person responsible for Mr. Assange's detention is himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was entirely self-inflicted, and it's yeah. astonishing the Right Honourable Lady should even bring up that report and suggest somehow <laughs> that it was a UN view or a UN report. And then the Right Honourable Lady talked about uh, the, uh, the US request for extradition. Uh, I won't be drawn into the request for extradition. It's rightly a matter for the courts. Should the courts deem it uh, correct and necessary at some point to send it to me as a request for extradition, I will consider it appropriately under uh, our laws. But, Mr Speaker, I note that the Shadow Home Secretary, both today and in the past, and indeed the Leader of the Opposition, have defended Assange and WikiLeaks from efforts to tackle their illegal activity. They, they, they could have clarified that today for the British public. The Right Honourable Lady could have done that on behalf of the Opposition, and she did. So why is it, Mr Speaker, that whenever someone has a track record of undermining the UK and our allies and the values we stand for, you can almost guarantee that the leadership of the party opposite will support those who intend to do us harm? You can always guarantee that from the party opposite. <laughs> Dr. Julian Lewis. How much has the police operation cost guarding the embassy, and is there any prospect of recovering any of this money, perhaps from Mr. Assange's celebrity backers? Yeah. <coughs> it's, it, Mr. Speaker, it's an interesting uh, suggestion of cost recovery uh, from my honourable friend, but I, I can tell him uh, up to 2015, the figures I have for up to 2015, uh, the police operation has cost uh, an estimated 13 Point two million pounds. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also thank the Home Secretary for advance sight of his statement. I'm sure his uh, swift actions and determination to appear before the House have not been lost on his audience on the Tory back benches. Um, it's right that nobody is above the law, and in many ways, uh, today's actions mean at least one kind of deadlock has been broken, and that's perhaps important, at least from the health and well-being point of view. But at the same time, human rights under the law are inviolable. And the treatment that Mr Assange receives in the period to come must take place with appropriate due process and with respect to the protection of his rights that the Home Secretary stresses. So can he confirm that nobody should be extradited from the United Kingdom if they face an unfair trial or a cruel and unusual punishment in the destination country? And can he also assure us that any judicial process here in the United Kingdom will be carried out with as much transparency as possible and with all appropriate opportunity for review and appeal as necessary? <coughs> Mr Speaker, I am actually very happy to, to agree with the Honourable Gentleman what he said. Uh, th this country has a long and proud tradition of uh, human rights, and when it comes to extradition requests, wherever they may come from, uh, it is absolutely right that the courts and the government consider an individual's human rights. Uh, Sir Hugo Soir. And so this uh, story moves to its conclusion, having cost the British taxpayer uh, millions of pounds, uh, having ruined relations during that period between uh, Ecuador and the United Kingdom, and I very much hope that those relations can now be uh, sustained and nurtured. Uh, but let me just say two things, if I may, Mr Speaker. We should not allow Mr Assange to get away with the idea, one, that he was arbitrarily detained, which is ridiculous when he could have walked out of that door at any one time, and secondly, the fact that he had no charges to answer originally in Sweden, because the Swedish prosecutor would have needed to interview him personally, something that he never allowed her to do. Those two facts need to be put right in the middle of, of this ridiculous story. Integrity. Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend has made a, a number of uh, important points, and uh, he also refers to our relationship with Ecuador, uh, which is uh, very good, and I think uh, today's 
uh, outcome shows that. And, and as I said, and I will say again, thanks to the, the hardworking efforts of the Minister of State, for the Americas and the Foreign Office, uh, the, those relationships are very strong uh, today. And, and when it comes to Mr. Assange's uh, detention, uh, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to remind the House that a detention, this is a self-inflicted detention. This was a decision by Mr. Assange to lock himself up for seven years. Yes. The Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm pleased that the right honourable gentleman mentioned Sweden because the Home Secretary didn't mention Sweden and the fact that, that there, was, there were proceedings in Sweden which led, as I understand it, to the, to the warrant being issued originally. Is it in fact the case that the Swedish proceedings will be continuing? And if there is any comp competitive aspect between the Swedish prosecution and the United States prosecution, how will that be resolved? Mr. Speaker, I can tell the Honourable Gentleman that the original uh, extradition request was a Swedish extradition request, but then uh, at a later date the Swedish authorities chose to withdraw their request. Whether there is a, an existing or new Swedish request, I can either confirm uh, or deny. And should there be for any individual more than one extradition request, that would be dealt in the usual way by the courts. Bob Seeley. Mr. Speaker, I understand the extradition, the potential extradition to the US is in relation to the half a million leaked documents in the Chelsea Manning case. Would you agree that there's a more serious and disturbing case potentially against Julian Assange for his and WikiLeaks' role in the Kremlin's 2016 attempts to interfere and manipulate the US presidential elections when WikiLeaks was used by Russian military intelligence, the GRU, as the primary vehicle to disseminate the stolen documents hacked by the GRU from the Democratic Party. And while some see him as an information war hero, others see him as a useful stooge of, of an authoritarian state. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure my honourable friend would uh, understand it would be inappropriate for me to uh, to refer to any uh, accusations that may or may not be made against uh, Mr. Assange. Uh, but uh, I understand that my honourable friend has talked about this on a number of occasions, including, as I understand it today, on the world at one. He's very articulate, and I'm sure that many people would have heard him. Mr. Edward Davey. Can I thank the Home Secretary for his statement? And clearly, today's arrest is correct. Uh, but looking ahead, will the Home Secretary confirm? that any extradition request from the United States will be considered by the Home Office and including in that consideration there will be a public interest test consideration and a press freedom uh, consideration and indeed that any court hearing an extradition uh, uh, case uh, would, it would also be able to consider a public interest test and a press freedom defence. Secretary. Mr Speaker, I thank the right honourable gentleman for his uh, support for today's action. And in relation to what happens next uh, with, with respect to the extradition uh, request, that will be, uh, in the first instance, it's a matter for the courts. Uh, there will be, once a full extradition request uh, is received, uh, my department will receive that and we will determine whether it is uh, certifiable or not. But after that, it, it will go to the courts and the courts will have to make the initial decisions according to our law. Stuart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Julian Assange says apparently that his personal space has been violated, which is a bit rich considering the number of people who have been put in extreme danger among our allies. Home Secretary. Well, uh, it perhaps might be appropriate, Mr Speaker, to draw uh, attention to the statement today from President Moreno of Ecuador, where, and I quote, he said that to, today I announced that the discourteous and aggressive behaviour of Mr Julian Assange uh, has uh, led him uh, to his actions, so it, it does tell you something in itself. Diana Johnson. Mr. Speaker, um, I'm really concerned that uh, a man suspected of rape, which yeah. is what in this case actually happened, yeah. Yeah. was able to uh, do what he did for several years to escape justice. And I've seen media reports that uh, lawyers for the victims in Sweden are uh, taking steps to try and start the proceedings off again. I wondered if the Home Secretary might be able to investigate that and let the House know, because I'm sure there are many members of Parliament who are very anxious about this matter. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I do, I, I do understand uh, very much uh, uh, the, uh, the, the concerns of the uh, Honourable Lady. And it, again, it would be inappropriate for me to talk about any accusations that have been made by whether it's from, from Sweden or elsewhere uh, against uh, 
uh, Mr. Assange. Uh, she may want to reflect her, the Honourable Lady on the words that were actually used by her front branch. And actually, in the past, in, in December 2010, 7th of December 2010, the Right Honourable Lady, that is now the Shadow Home Secretary, uh, was openly tweeting her support for Mr. Assange. And the Honourable Lady on the, on the opposition backbenches might like, want to actually reflect on the leadership she's receiving from her own front bench. Yeah. Matt Warman. You, Mr Speaker, the right honourable gentleman for uh, Surbiton is right to praise press freedom and I know the Home Secretary is an advocate for press freedom but whatever the Shadow Home Secretary says, is it not the case that responsible journalists do not play fast and loose with the national interest and put our people in danger when it should not be happening? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, my, my honourable friend, uh, a distinguished former journalist himself, is absolutely right in, in what he said. Press freedom in this country is sacrosanct, but what we find is that, by and large, uh, people that work in the press in this country are responsible. Clive Efford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I find it extraordinary that somebody who's just rich and powerful, or, or powerful anyway, can just avoid a, 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 an allegation of a rapist of being a rapist, in the way that Julian Assange has done for so many years, costing so much taxpayers' money. Can the uh, secretary, uh, can the Home Secretary, tell us who is paying the bill for the uh, 13.2 million pounds that Julian Assange has uh, has cost us? Is it is it the people of London in cuts to their police service, or does it come from a central budget? And, uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I, I do understand very much the uh, the sentiment of the honourable gentleman. I think he speaks for for many people across the house. The answer to who's paid that bill, and I referred earlier to the 13.2 million up to. Uh, 2015. Uh, that has come from various sources, but each one of those are the British taxpayers, and that's why they would welcome justice that's being done today. Stephen Kerr. Speaker, it's right and proper that my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has paid tribute to the Minister of State for Europe and the Americas for the work he's done, but it's also appropriate to pay tribute to the strength, the resilience, and the patience of the British diplomatic service. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I very much agree with my honourable friend, and in particular, if I may, is uh, pick out the British ambassador in Ecuador, who has been absolutely brilliant in how she has pursued this, how she has worked with uh, her counterparts in uh, Ecuador and Ecuadorian ministers and others, and indeed the, the ministers in the Foreign Office. And, and good luck to Matthew with his. Thank you. Uh, Ross Thompson. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I join my right honourable friend in sending our gratitude to President? Moreno for his decision, and does he agree with me that it is totally right that Mr Assange will now face justice and that he will do so in the proper way with the proper protections of the British legal system? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, I can give that assurance to my honourable friend. Uh, today is a very good day uh, for justice. The, the British legal system, our, our defence of the rule of law, and uh, the fairness of our legal system is world renowned, and that is exactly what Mr. Assange will receive. Mike Wood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I join honourable members in thanking my right honourable friend for his statement and the Metropolitan Police for their effective action uh, this morning. The Ecuadorian President has indicated that Julian Assange repeatedly violated the conditions of his asylum at the Embassy. Does my right honourable friend have any further details of such violations? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, first of all, can I join my honourable friend in, uh, in, in his thanks for the Metropolitan Police, who, who have uh, for many years done an outstanding job, but today uh, certainly in, in making sure Mr. Assange was arrested and presented in front of the courts. And um, the, the, he asked me about the Ecuadorian uh, government. I might uh, point his attention. Uh, to the uh, statement that's been made today in, in a video message by President Moreno, and uh, he has talked there about how Mr. Assange, in the opinion of the President, uh, has been discourteous uh, and aggressive and, uh, there, uh, and makes a number of accusations against Mr. Assange, which is uh, one of the reasons that the President decided, as a sovereign decision of the Ecuadorian state, to remove what they call diplomatic asylum. Th thank you uh, uh, to the Home Secretary very much indeed and to colleagues. Yes, a point of order, Mr Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd be very grateful for your guidance in respect to a matter which arose earlier today at DCMS Questions. It concerns comments that you, Mr Speaker, made about the planning application in my constituency 
uh, for the development of a beautiful, unspoilt part of countryside at Park of Keir. You rightly take every opportunity to praise Judy Murray, someone whom I know you fully respect and admire. And you rightly identified Judy Murray as one of the sponsors of the said proposed development of Park of Keir. But my question is, how can I make it clear for the record that there is a substantial body of opinion in Dunblane and Bridge of Allen among my constituents who want there to be a legacy for Andy and Jamie Murray in the Stirling area, but who do not want this piece of glorious countryside to be developed for that or any other purpose. Well, the honourable gentleman has found his own salvation, and he's done so with very good grace and an admirable sense of humour in relation to what is a serious matter. He's doing his constituency duty as he judges it right. Look, I completely respect the fact that there are different points of view about the matter. I did express public support for Judy Murray and Park of Keir some considerable time ago, and I reiterated it. But the Honourable Gentleman has made his own point in his own way, and I recognise immediately that he also speaks for many other people as well. He's put that on the record in a perfectly proper way, and I think that we can both honourably leave it there. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Point of order, Sir Mike Penning. You, on Monday, you kindly granted a UQ when medical cannabis was confiscated from a child when she entered the UK from Holland. I can tell the House today that a prescription has been issued for that medical cannabis so that young girl can have the medication she needs. Sadly, at the moment, there is still a blockage. And I wonder, with the Home Secretary on the front bench, and I know he's tirelessly working to help us, whether that blockage for that prescription to be honoured is yet to be done. Well, I say this, it's usually used pejoratively, but I say it in a non-pejorative sense. The Right Honourable Gentleman has opportunistically taken the chance to raise a point of order with me in the full knowledge of the presence of the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary is not obliged to respond, but he looks as though he wishes to do so. The Home Secretary. Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to respond, and it's, it's perfectly proper that the uh, uh, right honourable gentleman has raised this issue because it's a really important issue uh, and uh, he was right to raise it earlier this week as well. Uh, the Home Office has been uh, working with the Department for Health and Social Care uh, because it is the Health Department that is responsible for issuing of licences uh, since uh, the prohibition was lifted but we will continue to work carefully and we will certainly make sure that it can be done as soon as possible. Perhaps I can be forgiven for saying in the the gentlest and most understated of spirit, that having known the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Hemel Hempstead, for a good many years, uh, the sooner that interdepartmental cooperation is brought to a successful conclusion, the better. Uh, for if that is not the case, I think I can confidently predict that the Right Honourable Gentleman, quite properly, quite properly, will go on and on and on about the matter, and on! <laughs> because he's a persistent <laughs> terrier of a parliamentarian. Uh, that UQ served a very important public purpose, and I think the Right Honourable Gentleman deserves great credit for bringing it to the House. And thank you. Yeah. A terrier is a very small... Yeah, well... The, 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 well I, yeah, 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 it's being suggested that the Right Honourable Gentleman is more a persistent Rottweiler than a persistent terrier. Or a bloodhound, yes, OK. Well, I think we pursued no, this matter to destruction no. for now. I'm glad that the House is in a good spirit. Uh, we come now to the presentation of Bill. Mr Alistair Carmichael. Thank you very much. Legal tender Scottish banknotes bill. Second reading what day? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Thank you. Order. We... Come now. Are we dealing with the motion on the uh, Easter adjournment? Yes. yes, motion number one on the Easter adjournment. The whip to move. Okay, to move. Thank you. The question is as on the order paper. Does that pin say aye? Aye! <laughs> <laughs> Yelled with particular enthusiasm. Uh, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. On account of the urgent question and the number of statements, I think the House ought collectively to be informed that a judgment was made at a much earlier stage today by the chair of the Backbench Business Committee in consultation with debate sponsors <coughs> that the Backbench debate on the definition of Islamophobia in the name of the Honourable Gentleman the Member from Ilford was an extremely important debate 
that deserved a proper allocation of time and should therefore be rescheduled. I think that would be seemly and respectful. And therefore, we now come to the resumed debate, and the debate sadly interrupted by the rather well publicised leak last week. And we come to the resumed debate on the motion on the introduction of the 2019 loan charge. Justin Matters had finished. Yes. Justin Matters had just concluded his oration when the debate was suspended last Thursday, something I'm sure all colleagues recall very keenly. <laughs> and therefore, I think I'm right in saying that the next person to speak in this debate is Mr. Stephen Metcalf. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and for being called so early in this resumed debate. Um, I have to say, I had never imagined I was going to uh, speak in this debate, seen as rain kind of stopped play at about this time uh, last week. And I am by no means an expert on the loan charge. But I, like many others who expressed an opinion last week, have been contacted by numerous constituents who have been setting out in clear terms how they believe that the loan charge, the 2019 loan charge, would impact on them. And they are being asked to pay back thousands, tens of thousands, indeed, in some cases, even hundreds of thousands of pounds that they never believed would be due. Now, don't get me wrong. Everyone wants, I believe that everyone should pay their fair share of tax. We know that that's what funds our public services, uh, and we should clamp down on tax evasion at every possible opportunity. But minimising tax exposure has always been a legitimate part of our tax system. So, when looking at this, I have been on a journey. Initially, I was in two minds about the validity of the arguments that were presented. Obviously, I had great sympathy for my constituents, 